Groundwater Sustainability Agency Forum, March 21, 2019. Good morning, everyone. I'll do it this way. <laughs> and welcome to uh, DWR's first Groundwater Sustainability Agency Forum. My name is Tarn Ravazzini. I'm a deputy director at the department, and I am the um, executive lead for the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act implementation for the department. I see a lot of familiar faces, and I'm really appreciative of the great turnout for this uh, first event that we have. <clears throat> um, a couple of housekeeping things. First off, at DWR, we like to begin every, every meeting with a safety moment. So to bring you all into the DWR culture, our safety moment today is recognition of in the event of an emergency, please look around and notice where all of the exits are. So we have exits behind you, exits in front of you, and to my left here. Uh, if something needs to happen and we need to leave the building, we'll be going through these exits here, through these uh, glass doors out and then the convening location will be under the solar panels which is part of the parking lot uh, out here on the north side of the building. So now you've had your safety moment. Next important housekeeping is restrooms. Restrooms are through the hallway and down to the right. We have a, a very uh, full agenda today and I'm really looking forward to hearing from not only our panelists but from those in attendance, um, we do hope to have a robust question and answer session and also a networking lunch. So uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. So uh, thank you again all for being here. We do have um, this event today being videoed, so it will be uploaded within the next couple of days so you can have access to, again, all of the panelists, the slideshows, presentations, um, so we are very um, uh, pleased that you could all be here in person in order to make this a much more interactive uh, exchange today. But again, we also, for those that couldn't make it, we wanted to make it available to them as well. So you'll also be able to see that online. So I did kind of uh, mention that the setup for today's event, but we have two panels today. Um, populated by Groundwater Sustainability Agency representatives. Uh, we will be learning from them the many approaches they are taking to their unique basin challenges. Uh, we will have that networking lunch and we do wanna make some time for that. Um, during that time, we have Department of Water Resources staff available outside if you saw where you registered. There are a handful of tables and so staff will be um, manning those tables and we want to um, offer up the opportunity to speak, to have you all speak with those folks who are subject matter experts uh, to answer any questions you have on particular issues like Bulletin 118, um, Groundwater Sustainability Agency formation issues, things along those lines, those will, um, we have opportunity for that. So speaking of, we have a really great showing of department staff here as well. Uh, I'd, if we could just have a raise of hands so that folks who are here, they can see who's representing the department today. Great, so all these folks are here uh, to interact with you, so please don't be shy. Um, we also have some representatives from the State Water Resources Control Board and Department of Fish and Wildlife and any other um, state agency here today. Great. Great. Thank you all for being here. Um, again, this is a, a free public event. This is important for the department to host these kinds of events. So this GSA forum is what we are hoping to be one of many in the future. Uh, we will be looking for feedback from attendees to find out how we can not only improve uh, these forms, but also come up with additional ideas and suggestions. So do look forward to a survey that will follow this event, uh, and we really do look forward to your feedback. Um, our panelists uh, are also here today. They've made themselves available to share their experiences and insight voluntarily. Uh, and we do look forward, again, to an interactive exchange with them. 
Uh, we will be managing this event in a manner that is respectful not only to our panelists but also to the commenters because I do recognize we have a lot of uh, issues out there and so just uh, we really ask that all of you uh, recognize that this is a professional environment and we really want to foster positive uh, communication and exchange. So moving on, I have so many things that I really want to say today that I have about 10 pieces of paper up here, which should scare you, actually. Um, <laughs> but I, I have to say, I really also want to keep this short because I don't want to um, just gab on when we have really people here to share their valuable experiences. I really want to save a lot of time for the Q&A to make those robust experiences and exchanges. Um, so again, um, we are very pleased to be here today. We are at a, a critical juncture for Sigma implementation. I won't go into the history of Sigma or any of that. This is um, really, I imagine everyone here knows Sigma exists. You probably wouldn't be in this room if, if you didn't. Um, but we, uh, we've had a lot of positive momentum and I, we wouldn't even be able to hold this forum for groundwater sustainability agencies if you all did not form groundwater sustainability agencies. So I really have to compliment uh, those folks in the room, the stakeholders that engaged in that, the local agencies that were involved in that, for meeting that very first and aggressive timeline to form these new governance structures, these new local agencies to support Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, and that really is one of our uh, first major successes Sigma has, gives us all responsibilities to reach sustainable groundwater management in California for a, uh, by a 2040 deadline for critically overdrafted basins and a 2042 deadline for high and medium basins. So all of us in this room do have discrete roles that are meant to complement and support bringing the state's groundwater basins into balance. And that's one of the things I really want to achieve today is um, some clarity on the significance of the roles of the local agencies, the GSAs, and, and the responsibilities that they have, and also to impart how the department provides assistance and also maintains an additional role in being the evaluator of the plans that will be coming our way. As well, today after the second panel, we will be hearing from State Water Resources Control Board representatives because they are also a key agency involved in the implementation of Sigma. So one of the things I'm sure that um, has led us to be uh, in this room today is that we know Sigma is a very, very heavy lift. We know this is not an easy, easy task. It's not easy for, again, each and every one of us that have some role to play. And so the more we can encourage communication and the more we can coordinate, the better off we will all be uh, in reaching this state's uh, very impressive goal. So today in highlighting the central tenet of Sigma that groundwater management is best done at the local level, we are showcasing the range of approaches that locals are taking to manage their basin dynamics under Sigma. Now I mentioned the early success of GSAs. I want to um, just highlight that by the statutory deadline, we have uh, 267 GSAs that were formed. They covered 143 basins, and that is an over 98% coverage of the high and medium priority basins uh, that are now managed by a GSA. So we're getting off on the right foot to implement Sigma here today. So since the passage of Sigma, DWR and the State Water Board have been working um, on, on our end uh, to meet the state's obligations uh, in the early phases of Sigma. And this will continue past the submission of the groundwater sustainability plans. So uh, just like implementation beginning the minute those plans are in. The, once those plans are approved, implementation begins. So the department in our dual role of providing local assistance, planning, technical, and financial assistance, we will continue that robust assistance role into the planning phases of Sigma, excuse me, into the implementation phases of Sigma. 
And as you know, the critically overdrafted basins have to meet their deadlines sooner. So they'll be implementing while others are still planning and creating their plans. So the department in our role will be uh, and is committed to maintaining a robust assistance program to support all of the groundwater sustainability agencies and stakeholder entities that are working to implement and plan for Sigma, while we also take on the role of evaluating those groundwater sustainability plans in the statutorily required two-year time frame. Uh, today's date, March 21st, it marks a 316-day countdown until the deadline for critically overdrafted basins to submit their GSPs. It's, I really didn't mean to be funny, but... Uh, <laughs> um, for the high and medium basins, your deadline of January 31st, 2022 is 1,047 days from now. So that seems a little more feasible, doesn't it? But we recognize that 316 days really begins, um, well, it's all beginning, but it really does um, give us a sense of why talking together and finding out ways to address the challenges that we know are there with this very heavy lift, um, this is just all very, very important. So it's important that we're all doing this together We, um, we haven't been here before. I think that's something that's also really important to note. The state hasn't been here before. The locals haven't been here before in terms of statewide management, regulation of groundwater management. And so we need to recognize that that's where there is no exact right answer. I mean, from the department's standpoint, um, especially with the heavy lift again for data and the uncertainty around data that's there. We recognize that there is a need for being able to bring to us what you can, which are complete groundwater sustainability plans by the statutory deadline that covers an entire basin. But with that and with the 20 year planning horizon to reach sustainability, there's also a need to recognize on all of our parts that we have to adaptively manage. Sigma is outcome-based, so there will be continual engagement with the, the board, with the department, and with other entities to help improve as we learn with the plans that you develop, as we learn, are we reaching sustainability? Are we meet, reaching those thresholds that you are setting are you meeting your goals? And let's find ways to help do that. But we do need some time to see that. And so we just have to recognize that all plans, plans won't be perfect right off the bat. Plans won't be perfect. But it is important to show us that you understand your basin and that you, in the areas where you don't understand, you know you don't know it. You know you don't know that, so how are you going to get there to help improve that plan to reach those sustainability goals. So that is another reason why we do have such a large showing of department staff, particularly here today, as you're thinking about those things, definitely please reach out to those staff. We really wanna make them available. I, um, I have staff over here who wanna need to, I think they have a, it's a wrap showing. <laughs> so I will, um, I will draw this to a close, but um, what I really want to make sure you understand is that in the department's assistance role, I know how, how enticing it is to look to the department to say, just tell us what it is that gets us a perfect plan. And part of, again, the central tenet of Sigma with it being done with control to be kept at the local level is because it's the locals that know what their basins are all about, that complex geology. And so in order to really keep that authority there, you are really the ones that define what sustainability is for your basin. The department is committed in assisting those agencies who are working towards reaching sustainability for their basin. 
but we cannot tell you what it looks like. We can provide you in economies of scale, statewide data sets. We can clarify the regulations for you, but we cannot and we will not undermine the evaluation of those plans when they come to us by reviewing those in advance. So this is really important because we do need to balance the realm of regulatory flexibility with regulatory consistency. And so that is something that the department is working on. Um, I would like and I look forward to feedback from those of you in the audience as it relates to that. And also with respect to forums, I think this is why we really want more feedback for how we can pursue additional forums to ensure more robust discussion with those that are doing the planning. So being that I've now talked minutes after the that's a wrap sign, um, I'd like to introduce Stephen Springhorn and he will discuss the, um, he will introduce the first panel, which I'm very excited to have again, all these great leaders in groundwater management here with us today. Thank you all and I look forward to talking more with you. Taryn leaves lectern and Stephen walks up. Thank you, Taryn. Good morning, everyone. I'd also like to thank all of you for being here today. I think this is a really important event for us to be here, as Tarn mentioned, to share ideas, share perspectives, and to see how it's going on the ground. Um, so we've assembled a great first panel uh, to kick things off. The theme of that first panel is working together as GSAs, and that has been and will continue to be a, a key part of SIGM implementation, um, and it started all the way back in forming the GSAs, where local agencies and entities work together to, to communicate, coordinate, and, uh, and really form those GSAs when, within the deadline and communicate to the department. I, I had a, first, a front row seat. I, I shared a cube wall with Mark Nordberg and uh, experienced the many hours that he was on the phone, the GSA hotline phone, uh, talking with many of you in this room. And so it was a lot of war hard work by all of you and the others across the state, as well as Mark and others. So, but it, it happened. And so that was a really big milestone that we all achieved. And it really built momentum going into the next, you know, what it, which is a, a heavier lift, the GSP uh, development phase. And that is another example of where working together is going to be critical, where each group uh, member of the GSAs or, mem or GSAs themselves are going to be bringing the knowledge that you all have, the tools you have, and all of that together to complete uh, those plans and get those complete plans submitted uh, within 316 days or 1,000 days, depending on where, where you are. But we know you can do it. Um, once those plans are in, the next phase of working together is implementing those plans. And that is something that is new when, when in Sigma or for the state, is really implementing statewide groundwater management and sustainable groundwater management. And again, that's where working together, bringing the different assets that each agency or member or entity in these basins have, bringing those together, and whether it's a project or action or project or anything like that, to bring them together and to implement the plans to meet your milestones and meet your definition of sustainability for the basin. And then finally, working together with the stakeholders in your basin, and this has been occurring um, and this is really the topic of panel two. And so before we go there, uh, and that'll be a lot more discussion in panel two, but I'd like to introduce our uh, great panelists here. They're uh, experienced water managers and GSA leaders from across the state. And uh, they're gonna give us their perspective. Um, and I think this group provides an excellent cross-section of the, the different Sigma timelines, whether they're in a, a, a 2020, basin or a 2022 time frame basin. Um, it's also a good cross-section of the management structures that are, that are being used, whether it's a single GSA and a single GSP, to multiple GSAs and multiple GSPs with a coordination agreement. So it's gonna, we're going to see how, how uh, that local control or that flexibility, flexibility within Sigma is uh, being implemented on the, on the ground. And then the geographic coverage. We're gonna, we have folks from the southern Sacramento Valley over near the coast in Sonoma, uh, and, and then multiple entities from the San Joaquin Valley. Um, so again, I think it'll be a, a, a good first uh, panel to kick things off. And just, I wanna make sure it's clear that um, today, the purpose of today, and hopefully this makes the panelists 
sit a little bit more comfortably or relax is DWR is not here to judge or to comment or to evaluate <laughs> the approaches today. So I'm not going to be taking notes on um, this or that. It's really to share ideas. And so we should feel free to share those ideas. And we're looking for feedback um, as well. So um, all right. So with that, I'd like to introduce the panel. So first up uh, will be Kristen Sickey, from, who is the assistant uh, general manager at the Yolo County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, uh, who's representing or working in the Yolo Subbasin. I think I have a map here. Yep, and so it's these highlighted orange basins, so the Yolo Basin's there in the Sacramento Valley. Then we'll move over to the Sonoma County area, where Marcus Strada, who is a principal hydrogeologist from the Sonoma County Water Agency, uh, who's working in the Santa Rosa Plain, Petaluma, and Sonoma Valley basins, will give us his perspective. Then we'll head south into the San Joaquin Valley, uh, where Lacey Karioku will, who is a water resources coordinator for Merced County, uh, who's also working in the Merced um, subbasin. Then we'll move slightly west to the Delta Mendota uh, subbasin, and Andrew Garcia, who is an associate engineer for the San Luis and Delta Mendota Water Authority, will give us his perspective. And then last but not least, we'll move further south uh, to uh, the Tulare and Thule subbasins in the San Joaquin Valley, and Deanna Jackson, who's the executive director of the Tri-County Water Authority, will be giving her perspective. So again, um, I think we have a lot to learn today, and I really appreciate everyone being here um, and sharing your ideas. So uh, Kristen, can you please uh, take it away? Stephen leaves lectern and Kristen walks up. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. As uh, Stephen said, I'm Kristen Sickey with the Yolo County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. And today I'm representing the Yolo Subbasin Groundwater Agency. Um, this is just my brief outline for today. I'll go over the basin setting, uh, the integrated regional water management foundation that the county had, a uh, history of groundwater monitoring in the subbasin, and then just information about the GSA formation. Um, Stephen helped with this on the basin setting, but just to give you guys an idea, um, we're currently in the Yolo Subbasin, so if you want to leave a donation at the door, that would be great. Um, we're, we're bounded on the north by the Calusa Subbasin, on the south by the Solano Subbasin, and then our partners to the east are the Sutter and North and South American Subbasin. Um, and Currently, there, there's, uh, the groundwater use is 95% in, ur in agricultural or rural areas, and 5% is uh, agricultural use occurs in, excuse me, groundwater use occurs in the urban areas. Um, historically, there were four subbasins that were actually in our county, and we went through the basin boundary modification process to simplify it and just get one subbasin in the county to help to align with existing county planning processes. Um, and a big part of that was that the, in the county we had what was known as the Water Resources Association of Yolo County, the WRA, that had existed for 25 years uh, before Sigma occurred. So we thought that that served as a really good foundation for starting this uh, new GSA formation process. Um, and a big effort that the WRA undertook in 2007 was developing the Yolo County Integrated Regional Water Management Plan. Um, so that served as a core document for the county because it covered water supply and drought preparedness, water quality, storm drainage and flood control, aquatic ecosystem enhancement and recreation for the entire county. And it, it was an excellent um, process of convening all the local stakeholders and collaborating. And um, it just really helped to form the relationships that already existed in the county. Um, so as part of that, there were foundational actions that were in the Integrated Regional Water Management Plan. And these actually aligned really well with what our goals are going to be for developing a groundwater sustainability plan. Um, as you can see in this list, groundwater monitoring, groundwater modeling, um, subsidence monitoring, those were something that were already recognized in our 2007 IRWM plan to be critical to managers within the county for um, effectively and sustainably managing groundwater. 
Um, additionally, the WRA had started a water resources information database, which allowed all of these agencies that were already part of the WRA um, to enter in or to provide their groundwater monitoring data that they already had, which then gave us this awesome amount of information to go around during the GSA formation process to um, outreach to stakeholders and let them know, hey, we already have this long record of data. There's over 500 wells within the WRID, and there's a record of about 50 years of groundwater data. And so we let them know that we were prepared for the legislation and we felt like we already had a good handle on things with a lot of empirical data for moving forward and developing a groundwater sustainability plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as part of my agency's efforts, we have 115 groundwater wells that we monitor whoops, twice a year. Um, this is the average depth to groundwater hydrograph and the high points are the uh, measurements that are taken in spring, the low points are the measurements that are taken in fall, um, and it, as you can see, it goes back to 1975. So this was a, a really powerful tool for us to use in our outreach efforts to say that we have this long record, record of data and information, um, and we show that we can recover during the droughts, the 1992 drought, the uh, 2009 drought, 2014 drought, um, and then, of course, the 1977 drought. Um, and then the groundwater levels seem to recover after every irrigation season as well. Um, so this is something that really helped us to communicate with the locals. <clears throat> Additionally, um, we have 15 real-time groundwater monitoring wells within our county, um, or excuse me, within our district that's hooked up to our SCADA system. Um, and this was another really powerful tool for talking with landowners because they really like to see the real-time data, what's going on right at that moment, since groundwater is very exciting. Um, <laughs> so here is our depth-to-water historical comparison of those 15 wells. We have it every year on that date. It's comparing what the, what the depth-to-groundwater was. And as you'll see on the far right, there's the red box that shows the difference between 2019 and 2018 on March 19th. Um, it shows the difference in groundwater levels. So a negative number would mean that, <clears throat> excuse me, a negative number would mean that the depth of groundwater is lower than the previous year, but a positive number would mean that the depth of groundwater is higher, <clears throat> or excuse me, the groundwater level is higher. Um, and then here's just another hydrograph, because you can never have too many, but this is our, our headquarter well, uh, depth to water, just showing the real-time information. So we were able to use all of these uh, tools and this, this foundation that we already had to create a brand new agency. Um, even though we had the Water Resources Association of Yolo County, it wasn't an eligible GSA by the means of the legislation. Um, so the WRA partnered with the Yolo County Farm Bureau, and we went and we reached out to all uh, eligible GSAs within the county to see if they were interested um, in joining us to create a new agency. And I think a big part of our success was partnering with the Farm Bureau because that let the local landowners know that we were to be trusted, <laughs> essentially, um, because the Farm Bureau was going to be involved the whole way and had a vested interest as well, obviously, in securing groundwater supplies. So as we went through this, we ended up forming the Yolo Subbasin Groundwater Agency that had 19 eligible GSAs in it and five affiliated parties. So we have a 24-member board, which is large, but so far everybody has gotten along great. Um, and um, we were able to create this new agency by way of a JPA, and then the JPA signed an MOU with the five affiliated parties, such as the Farm Bureau, um, the Mutual Water Company, and others that weren't allowed to be their own GSA, but by joining us, they were able to have a seat at the table and essentially be an equal partner, which made it very collaborative and successful. Um, and as I mentioned, we originally had four subbasins in the county, but when we realized there was this process to modify the subbasins and to try to make it more, um, more consistent with existing planning within the county, we decided to go through the basin boundary modification process. Uh, we had a little hiccup down in the 
kind of the panhandle, the south part of the county. There were three reclamation districts down there that weren't sure they wanted to join us just yet. So they didn't want to go on in that first round, but then in the second round you'll see we now are essentially one entire subbasin with the county extents. And we're going through the process currently of trying to bring those three reclamation districts into our subbasin groundwater agency. Um, so one of the biggest obstacles throughout this process was just trying to identify the fears of the agencies that would be joining on to this new agency. And we quickly realized that the biggest concern was that we'd be forming a new agency that would have the authority that would affect or impair the autonomy of the existing agencies. Um, so we were able to develop our JPA so that it had very limited authority and so that the agencies would retain their autonomy and they would be the ones that would essentially, the fate would be in their hands about how things would work out. Um, in doing this, we created management areas throughout the subbasin to help split it up um, hydrogeologically so that there's a, a sense of team, uh, excuse me, a sense of a team throughout the management area, but it also helps with people understanding that it's going to be more of a um, beneficiary pay system instead of it having to be the north implementing a project that the entire subbasin pays for. Um, so we were able to just focus on the regional planning, monitoring, and reporting aspect of creating this new agency while still giving each of the agencies their own autonomy and authority in the process. Um, and so far, it's been going really well. We created this really simple schematic to help also let people know what would be happening. Um, we did individual water balances for each entity, and they were able to review the kind of the status of their groundwater situation, and then that is rolled up to the management area, and then that's gonna be rolled up to the subbasin GSA. But if there's any issues at the entity level, they are the ones that need to take care of it. They'll implement their own projects, management actions, and then we'll kind of figure it out as we roll it up to the management area and the subbasin level. <clears throat> and since that's a wrap, I'm going to finish. So thank you. Kristen leaves lectern and Marcus walks up. Good morning, uh, Marcus Trotta. I'm with the uh, Sonoma County Water Agency, now known as Sonoma Water. Um, and today I'm representing three um, GSAs that we're involved in, Santa Rosa Plain GSA, Petaluma Valley uh, GSA and the Sonoma uh, Valley GSA. And so I'm going to be providing an example of kind of three neighboring sub basins or basins that are all within a single county. They're all within Sonoma County. And they all formed a single GSA within each basin. So we have three GSAs that are going to prepare a single GSP for each basin. Um, so what I plan to do is really just provide some of the the regional um, setting and characteristics of each basin that help kind of go into uh, us getting where we're at, um, provide some information on the governance structure associated with those, uh, those GSA and kind of what the, the GSA formation process um, was like uh, to help us get, a, get us there, and then really kind of highlight some of the similarities and differences between uh, the three basins and talk a little bit about how some of those things are starting to play out as we're starting to, to move along and get, get going on our, on our GSPs and, and implementing uh, Sigma. Uh, so just to start, um, to provide you some context, Sonoma County is north, uh, north San Francisco Bay, uh, coastal uh, type groundwater subbasins and basins. Um, the, uh, the Russian River watershed is really an a important feature um, for us in Sonoma County. Uh, my agency manages uh, the water supplies associated with, uh, with that river system. We operate uh, two um, dams on, uh, on reservoirs up in the watershed, Lake Mendocino and Lake Sonoma. And then we divert um, surface water down on the Russian River and supply that to much of the uh, urban users within southern Sonoma County and, and Marin County. So we're kind of the, the main wholesale water supplier for, for urban interests in the, these groundwater uh, basins and in, in the southern portions of, of Sonoma County. 
and it's in the, the southern portions of the county where kind of our, our largest and more uh, developed um, groundwater basins uh, occur. And so we have the, the Santa Rosa Plain that's shown in blue here, Petaluma Valley shown in green, and then Sonoma Valley in kind of this, uh, this orangish color. Um, they're all uh, currently medium priority basins, although we are, are waiting on that final determination because there were some basin boundary uh, changes. And so none of them are critically overdrafted. So we're on that, uh, I guess, uh, over a thousand days. So I'm, I'm, I'm much less stressed now. Um, <laughs> There is still a chance that um, a, another groundwater basin that, that occurs to the west that adjoins both the, the Santa Rosa Plain and the, uh, the Petaluma Valley Basins, the Wilson Grove Formation, um, could get elevated to medium priority. Um, it was proposed to be medium. Um, there has been some basin boundary modifications, so we're waiting on DWR to recalculate uh, those metrics to see where that, where that ends up. Um, eagerly awaiting that. Um, and so I just, uh, these maps are pretty busy, but I just wanted to kind of show them to um, provide kind of some visual, uh, um, uh, a visual on some of the, the similarities and, and differences. So these are um, basically like water type um, sector um, maps for the three basins. So this is a Petaluma Valley um, shown here, Santa Rosa Plain and, and Sonoma Valley. And you can see that the urban areas are kind of in this yellow. So those are mostly receiving imported water, um, surface water from the Russian River from outside of the, the basins. Um, most of the cities also have their own um, groundwater wells and extract groundwater from those basins to supplement those supplies to kind of varying, varying degrees depending on the, on the city and their infrastructure and their, their hydrogeologic setting. Um, so that's, that's an important feature. Um, we also have a lot of uh, recycled water that's basically urban wastewater that's been treated and, and a lot of that is delivered to agricultural users in the basin. Those are shown in, in purple, Southern Sonoma Valley, much of uh, Santa Rosa Plain and Petaluma Valley. There's an increasing use of uh, recycled water um, that's offsetting uh, groundwater uses. And then uh, ag usage, the, probably the, the percentage of, of ag usage ranges from 30 to 40 percent of the total groundwater usage in these basins. Urban's on the order of maybe less than five to, to up to, uh, to 20 um, or more. And then uh, um, we have a lot of rural, um, uh, Sonoma County has one of the highest densities of rural domestic wells in the state. And so rural uh, residential usage de minimis users can account for up to a quarter of the total amount of, of groundwater use in the basins. Um, ag is primarily, irrigated ag is primarily uh, premium wine groups that are grown in, uh, in all three basins. Um, so a lot of the physical characteristics are also similar. The, the geology is really similar in all the basins. Interconnected surface waters exist in all, all the, uh, the different basins to various, uh, various degrees. We have, uh, we had a long program um, that goes back over nearly 20 years now of, of some USGS studies in all of the basins, uh, one of them still ongoing in Petaluma Valley. And then in the Santa Rosa Plain and Petaluma Valley, we had a history of uh, voluntary groundwater management programs, uh, which did not exist in, in the Petaluma Valley. So in terms of um, implementing uh, SIGMA um, and forming uh, GSAs, we went through a, about a two-year uh, facilitated process like many of you. Um, to, uh, to get to uh, that June 2017 deadline of forming GSAs. And this is uh, kind of getting to the chase. Uh, this is where we ended up. We have a single GSA in each basin that's made up of all of the eligible GSA agencies formed through a joint powers of authority of agreement. Um, we'll ha we have some kind of informal coordination between all of those basins, and I'll kind of I'll describe how that's how that, what that looks like. Um, but that, you know, that process entailed, uh, you know, uh, tons of meetings, you know, multiple work groups, subcommittees, public workshops. Um, I'm sure that's not, that's new, not new to any of you. Mm -hmm. And there were just a whole, whole range of, of options that were considered to various degrees. There was interest in forming kind of a, a single GSA to cover 
the entire county, but that, that met, was met with a lot of resistance at the time. You know, people in Petaluma Valley did not want someone in Santa Rosa deciding how their, their water was gonna be managed. So this is where, uh, where we've ended up. Um, just some of the uh, key features of the, the governance structure that's set up in those GSAs. So each member agency has one representative on the board with one vote. Um, there's supermajority votes that are required for certain, um, you know, high, high interest uh, items. And then there's a strong advisory committee um, in each basin um, to incorporate um, stakeholder groups into the, uh, the uh, decision making process and provide advice to the, to the boards. Um, we have built into the JPA um, a key um, uh, uh, time frames where there will be public meetings in the future to kind of review and reconsider uh, the, the governance process to make sure it's, it's working properly and to have a, a kind of an avenue to change if it needs to be uh, adapted. And then in the Santa Rosa Plain, as I'll describe, there, there was not an existing agricultural irrigation or water district. And so we built into um, that JPA there um, the opportunity for new eligible agencies to join um, once they, they form through the, through the LAFCO process. Um, this is just what the, um, uh, the members look like in each of the three basins. And uh, kind of the, the main thing I w wanna point out here is you can see that there's three um, agencies that are, uh, are members in all three of the GSA. So we have that, that common feature, the county, the Sonoma County Water Agency, and then one of the, uh, the RCDs. Um, and then otherwise it's, it's the you know, cities, water districts that, that are present in each of the basins. Um, in the, uh, the Santa Rosa Plain, there's a, a larger number of mutual and independent water suppliers. And so they joined up and, and are members of the board in that basin as well. And then I mentioned that there's a potential for a future agricultural uh, water district in that basin. So on the advisory committees, um, we have uh, you know, about 10 to 18 members on each, um, filling out some of the, the stakeholder groups that maybe aren't as, as, as well represented on the boards. Um, one difference is in the Santa Rosa Plain, uh, staff, so city staff actually sit on that advisory committee along with community members that are appointed by the board, so that's a, a kind of a distinction. And they, they, they have, uh, their purview is to, to provide advice on a whole range of, of activities from technical to, to fee proposals. Um, in terms of, uh, of the management, staffing, and funding, you can see some of the similarities in um, in many of the, uh, uh, the uh, service providers. Um, there are some differences, mostly in the Santa Rosa Plain, uh, where we have a consultant that's doing the administration. And then the biggest difference right now, really, is in the Santa Rosa Plain, is on the, the approach to, to funding through GSP development, where they're considering a Prop 26 uh, regulatory fee, whereas the others have decided to move forward with member agency contributions. And that's really uh, the main distinction right now in terms of of how the basins are moving forward. Um, and so I'm just gonna, I'll just leave this up here. Um, I think I covered uh, most of these um, in terms of the, the main similarities and, and differences within, within the, uh, the three basins. And happy to uh, answer any questions when we get to the discussion. Thanks. Marcus leaves the lectern and Lacey walks up. Good morning. I'm Lacey Kiriako. I'm the Water Resources Coordinator for Merced County, and in the county, I'm. Uh, oh, thank you. In the county, I'm working in all four of the basins that it are in Merced County. But today, I'm going to share with you about coordination in the Merced subbasin, and how the three GSAs in the Merced subbasin are working on a single uh, GSP. So here's a little bit of context. We're in the San Joaquin Valley. It's the Merced Subbasin. It's a high priority basin in critical condition of overdraft. So we're on that 2020 deadline. Um, our neighbors to the north are the Turlock Basin and they are in the 2022 deadline, but our, the rest of the neighboring basins are similarly critically overdraft. So we're coordinating on that same timeline. In the Merced Subbasin, uh, most of the use of water is agricultural. We do have some urban use in the cities. You can see the cities are mainly along Highway 99. That's Merced, 
Atwater and Livingston, and then we have some community services districts that also um, provide groundwater for, for drinking water. All of the communities in Merced County are disadvantaged communities, and so we're working with the disadvantaged communities. And then we also have some refuges along the San Joaquin River, which is the western boundary of that basin. And really along the eastern area of the basin is a lot of uh, just grazing and pasture land where the aquifer tends to peter out. The Merced Subbasin does have a history of working together on groundwater, and back in the 90s, they did form through an MOU, the Merced Area Groundwater Pool Interests, or MAGPIE. So MAGPIE worked on um, the cash gem reporting, and they also started a Merced Water Resources model, so a numerical model before um, Sigma was in place. We had been working on this numerical model, so we did feel confident um, when Sigma came that we were able to transition that model out of MAGPIE and into the GSAs, and that gave us a good step forward. The agencies in the basin are also working together on IRWM, and they formed the Merced Integrated Regional Water Management Authority, uh, MIRMA, and this is actually a JPA working on the Integrated Regional Water Management um, that does reflect members from each of the GSAs. And then Merced works together on the flood control issues with a Merced Streams group. So back in 2016, the County of Merced got together with the Merced Irrigation District, which is our largest irrigation district in the basin, and they pulled all of the agencies who are eligible to be a GSA together to discuss the Merced subbasin and potentially forming a single GSA working on a single GSP in the basin. At that time, we did already have uh, one GSA, the Turner Island Water District, and they had formed back in 2013, but they were still in the room for all of these discussions about a single GSP in the basin. And we met together um, sometimes monthly, sometimes every couple of weeks through uh, maybe the fall of 2016 when it just came out that we were better off with two large GSAs in the basin. And so what you see here is the Merced Irrigation Urban GSA in blue. This is in the footprint of the Merced Irrigation District, which um, is the surface water provider in the basin. And then there's the Merced Subbasin GSA, which is in the green. That includes the, the county and a lot of the other groundwater pumping districts. So here's just a list of who's in each of these GSAs. Uh, the Merced Irrigation Urban includes all of the cities and all of the community services districts, and they formed through an MOU. And the Merced Subbasin GSA is the unincorporated areas and a lot of the groundwater pumping districts. Uh, we do have a couple who do have surface water rights off the Merced River, Stevenson, and Merkeen. And then we do have a couple of mutual water companies who joined this GSA through participation agreements in uh, a JPA. So the public agencies here formed a JPA and then the mutual water companies are participating in that. After the GSAs formed in 2017, this group, representatives from this group, so a smaller, smaller meetings, started meeting together again to discuss how we were gonna coordinate for this single GSP. And that's when we came up with this coordination MOU that provides how the GSAs will coordinate on a single GSP. It has the structure for decision making um, included. So all the basin wide decisions are really um, outlined among this coordination MOU on GSP development, basin wide projects, and how we would share the costs basin wide. And the coordination MOU formed a coordination committee uh, this is representatives of each of the GSAs. They meet monthly. It's an open to the public meeting. And the coordination committee went through the RFP process for the GSP consultant. The coordination committee formed a stakeholder committee for outreach purposes. Uh, they did the branding, so you can see our Merced Sigma brand here. That all came out of the coordination committee. And the coordination committee also um, works on basin-wide outreach, so any of the basin-wide decisions come out of the coordination committee. This is our structure 
um, on where this coordination committee and the stakeholder committee fits in with the GSAs. So you have GSA leadership making the final decisions for everything. The coordination committee makes recommendations down into the GSA leadership. The stakeholder committee, they also meet monthly. So we have really long Mondays on the fourth Monday of the month where the stakeholder committee meets in the morning and then the coordination committee meets in the afternoon and the stakeholder committee, uh, it is made up of a diverse group. It's about 23 members. There are different industries, urban disadvantaged communities, environmental representatives, um, even geographically across the basin. And they discuss many of the same issues or topics that the coordination committee discusses and they can feed input into the coordination committee which gets down to the GSAs. It's a way for us to do outreach and know that we're covering a lot of the different sectors of the community. And we also intend for that stakeholder committee to not only feed information in, but to take what they're learning in these stakeholder committee meetings and then go back out to their communities and talk to their communities about what's happening with GSP development in the basin. And then finally, the general public who are able to come to all of our public meetings, but we also hold quarterly workshops in the basin, and that's where the general public can provide input into the process as well. So we do have some uh, protocols that are in place for decision making and for GSP development. And the first is that anything, any decision that comes out of the coordination committee is unanimous. And so part of this was a way to get around um, working on committee numbers and how do you decide you know, how many representatives each GSA could have. The Merced Subbasin GSA was limited by the Brown Act. They could only have three members. The Merced Irrigation Urban GSA wanted to have four members. Turner Island only needs to send one guy. How do we balance that? And part of the way to do that was having unanimous recommendations. And then the second part of that was we felt that if there was a voting structure in place and somebody did get outvoted, when that recommendation went down to their GSA, their GSA would just vote no. And we're working on a single GSP, and so how could we um, outvote somebody and still have a single GSP in the basin? Some of the key decisions that the GSA boards will approve that will come down from the coordination committee, um, one was the stakeholder committee members that was approved by GSAs. We'll have a basin-wide water budget that'll be approved, an allocation framework that'll be approved, and I think we'll see the sustainability criteria come through the GSAs as well as key decisions. And also, all of these key decisions, by the time they get to the GSA board, they've gone through the stakeholder committee, they have their unanimous uh, recommendation from the coordination committee, and so far they've all also gone through as topics in public workshops, in these quarterly workshops that we have in the public. So we know that by the time the GSAs have one of these key decisions to consider that it's gone through a vetting process. We also do hold some joint meetings among the GSA boards, and a lot of this is really just on GSP presentations. So when we have the consultants come down into the Merced Basin to provide an update on the GSP or, or an update on the water, water uh, budget, we'll have joint meetings for that. Um, so I have some challenges here, and I think it's probably familiar to a lot of the GSAs that are on that 2020 timeline. Um, one is public outreach. And I think there's really twofold here. We had really great turnout on the stakeholder committee when we first formed it. But um, we're finding that as we go along and we have these monthly meetings, turnout really starts to diminish a little bit. And so it's keeping the stakeholders involved. And then also, are we reaching all the communities in the basin when we have these public workshops our last two public workshops we've provided for translation, but nobody's needed it. So that's an indication to us, are we not meeting certain communities? Um, making sure everybody's on the same page so that when we discuss these topics, people are able to provide a valuable feedback, I think is another challenge, especially the way things are moving so quickly, which leads right into uh, the schedule. And that good consensus building takes time, even though the agencies in the Merced Subbasin have been working together for a long time. Uh, it still takes a while um, 
So you can see on the slide here, the water accounting should have been done around February. We're still talking about an allocation framework here, and it's May, just because this consensus building is taking time, that we really feel the pressure. And the last thing I want to mention, but I'm running out of time, is um, Merced County's role has changed a little bit through this. Um, the county uh, has constituents in all the GSAs, so they do want to see uh, successful GSAs through everybody, but now Sigma has brought in the county into managing the unincorporated areas, which I think is new for the county of Merced. And also the county of Merced has a groundwater ordinance that they passed back in 2015 regarding well permitting that changed the permitting process from discretionary, from uh, ministerial to discretionary. And so at the time they saw that as a bridge to Sigma, but I think one of the challenges for the county moving forward is how that ordinance is going to intersect with um, the GSAs and the GSPs. And so that is it for the Merced Subbasin, and I'm happy to answer any questions later. Lacey leaves lectern and Andrew walks up. Sorry if the microphone's blocking my face. <clears throat> okay. Um, my name is Andrew Garcia. I'm a senior civil engineer with San Luis and Delta Mendota Water Authority. Um, when the numbers get floated around for the total number of GSAs in the state, I like to show people this next slide. Um, so if there's 267 in the state and we have 23, you can all understand why uh, I'm a little stressed out over the last couple months and the next couple months. So, so we have 23 GSAs and we have six GSPs. Um, and we have nine neighboring subbasins. So coordination is my life, right? Um, <clears throat> we also developed a family tree, if you will. Um, so let's, and I could spend my full 10 minutes talking just this, but I won't, I promise. So the authority has two activity agreements. Um, we have one with this group of five GSAs and we have one with this group of three GSAs. Each of these GSAs are different. Um, one is a single GSA, one may be a multi-agency GSA. For example, this GSA here has 11 different entities or 10 different entities. Um, and this rolls up to a, a coordination committee because there's six GSPs, we have a coordination agreement. So we've, we've appointed a representative from each of these two committees to sit on the coordination committee. Similar to Lacey, we have a lot of meetings. It's not our Monday, it's our Thursdays. We have... Um, committee meetings here, and then we have regular monthly meetings of this coordination committee. And again, the structure for that is, is that's also a unanimous vote. Um, let me move forward a little bit. I, I get into the breakdown here. We have disadvantaged communities that are involved, water and irrigation districts, wildlife refuge, municipalities, multi-agency GSAs, individual agency GSAs. We have senior rights holders, junior water rights holders. We have um, riparian rights holders. So, Really, we have the whole gamut of interests, and so um, it's very important for us for the coordination aspect, right? We're not gonna get anywhere if we don't have people sitting at the table that can get along and understand everybody's differences. Um, so, so I'm gonna hop back here just to hit one more time on the coordination committee. Um, the, the big challenge is just the decision-making process. So the Brown Act makes things very difficult. Um, the fact that you know, anything that gets approved here unanimously has to make it back down for each of these folks to have a vote, it needs to go back to their GSA, and then back down to every individual district. So for me, it's, it's looking at scheduling and making sure that when a decision is gonna be made in June, we start talking about it in January, <laughs> so that it, it works its way all the way from the bottom up. Um, so when, it, when we start talking regional coordination, the nine subbasins. Some of these um, subbasins, Turlock, for example, are on different timelines. So, so the challenge going forward is is having meetings. Uh, I think the discussions right now are to have MOIs for coordination and not necessarily interbasin coordination agreements. And those MOIs will outline going forward. If if you're not in a place that that we're in, then how do we coordinate on data? How do we coordinate on results? And how do we make sure that you know when we submit our plans that we're not showing different water levels, one basin showing inflow, another basin showing outflow, those sort of things. Uh, and, and the difficulty being some folks are using groundwater models, some folks are using spreadsheets, so how do you um, coordinate on those results and how do you identify who's wrong and how do you fix it in the timeline that we have? 
Um, I didn't really want to spend a lot of time discussing how we formed our GSAs, but more how we're coordinating to implement the GSPs. And you all caught us at a pretty good time. We're right in the, the thralls of, of developing water budgets, finalizing our water budgets, and talking sustainable yield. Um, so, so really, through all that, it's, it's continuing implementation of the coordination agreement. And so when you have an eight-member coordination committee, we have a lot of the work being done on the background. So we have uh, technical working groups where each of these six GSPs that you can see in the different colors um, are, are working on their results. And then we come to the table monthly. We also talk weekly every Monday to discuss what are your assumptions, what data have you used, um, what are your preliminary results, and then how do we meet to, to ensure that when we are going to adopt these water budgets that we've had the difficult conversations and reconciled any differences. Um, some of the challenges we're working on right now is the coordinated um, sub-basin monitoring network and understanding that protocols are going to be very important. We don't want to be getting water level data, subsidence data, water quality data that's collected in different formats, reported in different formats. It's going to make somebody, the authority's life, um, very difficult in trying to wrap all that data together. At the same time, we're trying to develop a sub-basin data management system, which, you know, what attributes go into that. Um, and so having just more conversations, making sure that everybody's interests and data sets can easily roll up into that. And then continually discussing our, our, our data and modeling tools and understanding what goes into each person's model and what comes out of it and how do they how do they talk with one another and then lastly another key point is the development of the annual reports um, the regulations call for the first annual report to be submitted on April 1st I don't know about any of you but we're just trying to get the plan submitted and we're not really focusing <laughs> on the first annual report so now we have to start talking about what does that report format look like and do we all six of us agree on that format and what data do we need to start collecting now and who has that data so as soon as I leave here, that's what I'm going to go keep working on. Um, so I, I, like I said, I could talk about the actual coordination committee the entire time, but I do think it's important for folks who are right in the middle of development of things like sustainable yield, sustainable management criteria to hear what some of us are working on. So the first challenge that, that I noticed was when we call these coordination committee meetings and we're, and we're going to talk sustainable yield and, and sustainable management criteria, we all weren't talking the same terminology. And so how do you uh, determine sustainable yield? How do you determine minimum threshold if you're not all agreeing on the definition of what those are? So what we did is we created a list of every term, and we all came to an agreement on what those terms were. Then we came to a, an agreement on what is the list of things we need to coordinate on. So in order to have a coordinated GSP submitted, what is every single item that we have to agree upon to get to a water budget, a sustainable yield, a minimum threshold, and make sure that we all agree on that list, that, that way we can actually get them all accomplished in a timely manner. And in order to do it in a timely manner, we needed to come up with a schedule of how this coordination committee needed to get things done and when, and everybody needed to agree on it. And the reason everybody needed to agree on it is each individual GSP needed to be able to hit those milestones, right? So we didn't want to have an unrealistic coordinated schedule if it didn't overlap with your individual GSP schedule. Um, then, once we develop sustainable-wide uh, definitions, activities, and schedules, we can actually start working on development of the sustainable yield, which then leads us into sustainable management criteria. So the difficulty for us currently with sustainable yield is, um, again, the, the uniqueness and the differences between the various models and understanding what data went into some folks, what was an assumption, and, and what wasn't an assumption. So we're currently working through that, and I, I can speak to folks offline. I, like you said, we don't want to get into things that are still in draft form, so I don't want to put anything out there. But um, those sustainable yield numbers, um, currently you know, we're working on establishing those for the subbasin as a whole, both in the upper aquifer above the Corcoran clay, that's in the Delta Mendota subbasin, and for the lower aquifer in the confined aquifer below the Corcoran clay. Um, and the reason behind it being very important about differentiating between the two aquifers for us is subsidence is the dri driving factor in our subbasin. And so the extractions in the lower aquifer are very important for us to all agree on. Um, and from that, those discussions, it's really led to the importance of these sustainable management criteria. Um, you know, sustainable yield numbers can be one thing, but, you know, a water level or a subsidence rate may drive the actual sustainability plan implementation. And so it's going to be very important for us, and one of our next key steps is, is development 
and sharing those minimum thresholds, measurable objectives, and sitting around the table and understanding what everybody's looks like and how far off are we with our neighbors, and then working to correct those issues. Um, and then the last thing is developing a process to update the coordination committee on the long-term monitoring and implementation of the GSP. So one of my concerns is we're gonna have six GSPs, we have a common chapter that rolls up these six GSPs, <clears throat> but how do we keep each other informed of where our individual GSP is and what obligations do we have and what are the expectations from the other GSPs from each of the other GSPs, right? So, so that's something that we'll, <clears throat> we'll continue working on. We, we haven't really started trying to get through some of these difficult conversations with sustainable yield, of course. So some of the key concepts that I identified is things that have been discussed around the table, is that these initial plans are going to have high levels of uncertainty, and we all need to understand that and be comfortable with that in order to hit this timeline, this deadline. Um, these, these plans aren't gonna be perfect, and we, we really need to be willing to adaptively manage and agree that we're going to need to develop the tools and improve the information as soon as possible, right? It's none of the, the data is perfect. Um, a lot of us have data gaps, so we just need to agree on how we're gonna Im improve that data. And then understand that sustainability needs to be reached by 2040, right? Sustainability doesn't need to be reached in the first five years. It doesn't need to be reached immediately when we submit the plans, but we have a pretty decent timeline to actually reach our target. And then last, similar to some of the folks mentioned, um, overlapping efforts with IRWM and, and other regulatory programs is to leverage some of the existing efforts that are going on um, and some of the partnerships that may be there in order to share resources. So, uh, you know, I'll hop back to the importance of this is it may look very complicated, but when you have this number of parties developing one plan, it gets much more inexpensive when you figure out how you share those costs. So that's, that's why a lot of these folks organize this way and why we're working on a coordinated plan in this manner <clears throat> is we can, we can share a lot of the costs for the consultants who are helping us prepare sub-basin-wide results. So you know, an agency down here ends up paying far less than if they were developing an individual plan. Um, so with that, we'll happy to answer questions after. Thank you. Andra leaves lectern and Deanna walks up. Good morning. So three and a half years ago, I started attending Sigma forums and Sigma meetings. And after presentations and after discussion, a hand would go up in the back of the room and somebody would say, how does inter, interbasin coordination work? And the person who was uh, presenting would give a general answer and a shrug of the shoulders and we'd move on. So now three and a half years later, we, I'm attending technical meetings and manager meetings and every couple of meetings somebody will say, what are we gonna do about interbasin coordination? And uh, the room comes just to a complete hush. So when I received a call to talk on interbasin coordination, my first uh, statement was, what coordination? So <laughs> that gives you a little overview of where we are. Anyway, my name is Deanna Jackson. I'm with Tri-County Water Authority. I'm the executive director. And we are a joint powers agency. We cover uh, approximately 110,000 acres. And we are located between Bakersfield and Fresno. And Tri-County Water Authority has four member agencies. We have a water district, we have a stormwater district, we have a um, reclamation district, and we also have one county as a signatory. In addition to our member agencies, we have an MOU with Allensworth Community Service District, which is um, a severely disadvantaged community uh, service district. And we also are working on a second MOU with the County of Tulare, to cover additional white areas outside of our service boundary. Um, so we have uh, covered two sub-basins and we also cover two counties. We uh, have uh, chosen two different paths in uh, creation of our groundwater sustainability plans. So I, my uh, agency is a multiple GSA sub-basin agency working on one GSP and in the other sub-basin we are multiple GSA uh, agency working on multiple GSPs with a coordination agreement. So uh, again, we have two paths to development. In the Tulare Lake Subbasin, uh, we have chose to, well, we have um, five groundwater sustainability 
agencies, and we have chose to put together one plan. So we did an RFP, and we've hired one firm and one hydrologist to help us uh, create that plan. In the Thule Subbasin, we have six um, groundwater sustainability agencies. We are writing six plans. We did hire a hydrologist to do the basin setting for the entire uh, subbasin, but in many cases, we have our own hydrologist as well, and we each have our own uh, uh, engineering firm writing a plan to be coordinated through a coordination agreement. So our, basis, our, our basic groundwater setting is that we are in critical overdraft, and um, we are experiencing four of the six sustainability indicators. We have chronic lowering of groundwater levels. We have reduction in groundwater storage. We have um, degraded water quality, and we have land subsidence, which is a, a critical issue for our area. And in addition to that, we are studying currently whether we may have some interconnected surface uh, to groundwater connection and um, up, in, up towards the, uh, the Sierras, the mountain block. Um, so uh, so we, we have a lot of issues that we're having to deal with. Uh, and and who, who uses water in the Tulare Lake hydrologic region? Who uses the groundwater? Well, we have disadvantaged communities, um, severely disadvantaged communities, many of them, uh, small community service districts, and they are heavily reliant on groundwater, and in many cases, uh, that water quality is degraded. So they are, they are of uh, extreme concern to most of us. Um, we are rural, so we have literally thousands of domestic wells to, to uh, consider. And we have federal and state lands, as well as some wetlands that are groundwater dependent at times. And certainly last but not least on this slide is our agricultural community, which relies uh, predominantly on groundwater and um, is the economic driver for our entire region. And so the, I, the, the thought of Sigma is a, it's a really heavy lift for our region. And it is, um, that's a trickle down effect, so if we are uh, having to bring groundwater into sustainability, it's going to cause a most definitely a reduction in farming. And what is that going to do to the economy? And you can go right back to the top of the list and think about how that might affect people. So my favorite word in the regulation when we look at it is may. So this is, this is the best slide, right? So <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking that the authors of the regulation recognized what a heavy lift it would be to get to interbasin coordination. So it says we may get to an agreement and we may put in the plan and we may add some technical information in there, but, uh, but I, I really love that word. So what kind of agreements might be possible in interbasin coordination? So I think that we are looking at basin to basin agreements. We might be looking at basin to individual GSA agreements. And we could also be uh, studying uh, just GSA to GSA across the basin line agreements. And when you think about some reasons for those agreements, um, already discuss being discussed at the table is inflows and outflows. We have to probably come to some sort of agreement about what that means and how it affects each other. Um, there's also water budget agreements to be made across sub-basin lines. Is my water in your budget? And how did it get there and I want it back? <laughs> so we gotta, we, we're looking at those things. Um, is groundwater pumped in one basin? Is it moved to another basin? Do we need an agreement about that? Um, are we going to move into water markets and crediting? Do I have farmer A at one basin and farmer B at another basin? And farmer A says, I won't farm, but I want you know, to sell my water credits to farmer B. Can we do that? And must we have an interbasin coordination agreement in place to do that? Should we uh, have an agreement to mitigate for undesirable results? Am I causing an undesirable result across the line? And do we need an agreement to mitigate that? Um, we have tried and are still trying to do some data share agreements across subbasin lines. In some respects, those have been failures. I'm just here to tell you. But, um, <laughs> But uh, for model integration purposes and sharing of data, we, we're trying to put together some agreements uh, to protect data and to also share. And um, this I came up with, I like this, but I think we need to agree to give each other five years to disagree and maybe get a get out of jail free card for the first five years. Um, it's just, it's a big heavy lift right now. And so um, 
what are we doing? What are we doing? And the, if there's any legal minds in the room, you're going to like this. We have instructed our consultants to meet and confer. So go out. Let's talk about the data. Let's um, see where we are missing and, and where we do not uh, match up. So we've asked them to exchange data and technical information as much as possible and to identify those data gaps and discrepancies and where we need to do a better job. Oops. Um, and so one of the biggest challenges is the modeling effort challenge because in most cases, well, in some cases, they're not, we're not, some subbasins aren't doing or some basins aren't doing a numeric model. And the ones that are, they don't really match up well. So um, some of the problems we're having are the models are in different stages of development and calibration and, um, and forecast phase. Some of the models are using different methodologies and calculated by different methodologies. Um, some are using two different codes, ModFlow or CV2SIM. And um, the, a big problem that I've seen are, are the layers. So one model has four layers and one model has 30 layers or 15 layers and they just don't match up well. And um, also, um, the reluctance again to share data, and, and and even though it might be in a subbasins model, that data has not been authorized in some situations because uh, some of us are agencies, public agencies, so that data is out there. But others, these are new agencies formed over private individuals who have reluctantly giving up some of, have given up some of their information or data, but they're not necessarily. Uh, giving it up to us to share to the neighbor. So those are some problems that we see. And what's next? Um, I think we have to continue the pursuit of shareable data. And we have to analyze model discrepancies and identify those data gaps. Um, and monitoring and technical analysis uh, to fill those data gaps is going to be very important. I have a question for the Department of Water Resources. So, <laughs> If we can't at some point come to an inter, um, interbasin agreement, will they be facilitating resolution for us? Or could this possibly even trigger probationary status for us? Um, and then I'd just like us to recognize that this is an enormous task. And when you're looking at the San Joaquin Valley uh, as a whole, it's one big basin, and it's going to have to be coordinated in some respects moving forward in the future uh, on, a, on a holistic uh, uh, path. And, um, and that's a big lift for, for everybody involved. And so I think while interbasin coordination is encouraged and should the, the conversations have to be had, it's going to be very difficult to get to any formal agreements at the 2020 um, January starting point. Thank you. Deanna leaves lectern and Stephen walks up. All right. Thank you, everyone. That was a, a great uh, series of talks and window into how Sigma is going across the state. So now is the time for questions and discussions. We have a healthy amount of time to spend discussing um, what was presented today. So we could just jump right into the Q&A session. Thank you. Uh, I'm Diane Johnson. I'm on the advisory committee of the Borrego Valley Subbasin, way down southeast. We're, we're critically overdrafted, heavily SDAC, tiny uh, water district working with the county of San Diego. I wonder if anybody could tell us how you're funding your DS GSP development. That, that hasn't come up. Yeah, great question. Does anyone want to take, take that one? Voluntary agency dues, thank you. Um, and you know, we we started to talk about the potential for a Prop 218 process, but we decided to give ourselves a two-year deadline to try to work that conversation out because it's going to be tricky. Um, and we're actually going to extend that by a year. 
because we want to try to get the plan done before we really have to think about that. Um, the agencies are willing to provide their, their voluntary dues, which will help fund the plan, and we got a grant. So we feel like we can make it that far. Um, but we're trying to be creative, and so another thing we're looking at for the white areas is to annex them into existing districts or to talk with them about potentially forming their own new districts um, just because we'd really like to avoid the Prop 218 process. Um, but the future still is yet to be seen. So for our, uh, our area, um, that's, that's actually a topic of, uh, of interest right now. Um, so all three of the, the GSAs um, initially as part of their, their JPA agreed to fund the first two years of, uh, of implementation of, of developing the GSPs. And we were also successful in, in, in getting uh, grants from the Prop 1 uh, to help fund the GSP development, a million dollars in each of the three basins. But there's still additional funding that's gonna be needed through uh, GSP development, that whole, you know, through 2022 for us. Um, associated just with, you know, Brown Act meetings, legal fees and everything. And so um, there was also a, a fee study that was initiated in each of the three basins. Um, and at, going through that process, two of the basins, um, because they're less populated, um, less groundwater usage, and the fees we were looking at a Prop 26 regulatory fee. So those fees were going to be pretty high in Sonoma Valley and Petaluma Valley, and the boards and, and member agencies decided to, to just continue funding uh, through their own member agency contributions through the development of the GSPs. However, in the Santa Rosa Plain, uh, the situation is a little different, more urban interests, lar much larger population, more groundwater usage, the fees are a little more palatable. And so that basin is currently going through uh, the fee um, setting process and, and decision making on that, which is actually detracting a lot of, uh, of the attention and, and focus on, on what needs to be done in terms of the, the GSP development and has gotten some of the locals a little uh, a little interested and, and engaged. That's, that's, one, that's one way to get your stakeholders engaged is to, is to start a fee assessment. So for the Merced Subbasin GSA, it's a JPA and it's been, for the past two years, it's been funded by the member agencies and they have split the member agency contributions equally among the board seats. There are six board positions. If agencies share a seat, they decide how to share that, that equal split that they pay. But the Merced Subbasin GSA is in the be, uh, middle, kind of beginning to middle process of a 218, of going down the process of looking at a 218 for a per acre uh, charge to landowners. And actually tomorrow, tomorrow's GSA meeting is going to be the first time that this 218 is unveiled to the public. So I anticipate a lively meeting. On a Friday. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we uh, were f the both the Thule and the and the Tulare Lake Subbasin uh, charged the member GSAs or the member groups that began because we were in all GSAs at the time uh, per acreage, and um, we funded that through our member agencies uh, on a per acre basis. And my agency uh, subsequently last year did a Prop 218 election, so now. We're working on paying back those agencies, the seed money that we uh, that we started with, but that we did the Prop 218 election. I'm in the fortunate position where we just do a lot of the implementation and plan development discussions, but the actual GSAs are left to their own devices of how they're actually going to fund <laughs> these costs. So you know, um, it's it's different. There's going to be different um, do, dues to pay it or 218 processes, and um, so we're going to see the whole gamut. Thank you. I think I'll join you at the table here. Um, just one thing on the funding side from DWR's perspective. Uh, we do have an information booth out in the, uh, the other room there uh, describing the different funding mechanisms or funding programs we have offered by the department. So that might be an interesting uh, or a topic of interest uh, during the lunch. Yeah, yeah, just right over here. Okay. Yep. Okay, any other questions? So my, my name is Suzanne Petchy, and I am um, the alternate ag res representative on the Sacramento Central Groundwater Authority. And um, so my question 
is do you have issues with landowner based voting in your districts, your GSAs that contain mainly ag and some ag res residents? Uh, what could you identify what these issues are and how are they being handled so that the ag res residents in these mainly agriculture districts have a voice? not only in the plan, but in the assessments and in the fees that will be required to be raised in order to run these GSAs that are in the hands of agriculture interests. So um, in the Merced Subbasin, I think what speaks to this would be our the stakeholder committee that we formed. So we formed a committee and we were intentional about making sure that it included representatives, not only of uh, agriculture interests, but also um, the communities and the different geographic areas. So we do have, um, we have not only disadvantaged communities on there, but we do have other interests from, um, so in Merced County, we have municipal advisory committee. So we have a municipal advisory committee member that's also on our stakeholder committee to make sure that we get um, feedback from all those different areas in the subbasin because we do know it's a diverse subbasin. Anybody? Uh, we have done a number of public outreach. Uh, in fact, I have for our disadvantaged community, I have on April. In April, we're going to one of their community events to do another community outreach to, the, to their community. I don't, um, I don't have a lot of, uh, I only have the one community. Other than that, truly is agricultural based in, in my uh, GSA. We do have a stakeholder group at which I have the Bureau of Land Management attends because we have federal lands in our GSA. Um, I also have um, uh, the Tulare Lake Basin Wildlife Partners have somebody that attends, um, and uh, and usually we have a community rep from our from our disadvantaged community that comes. He, in fact, one of the um, uh, most active members uh, was one of the founders of the board for our GSA. So until recently, and, and the only reason he's not there is because they have a, a vote that he's no longer eligible. Anyway, that's kind of, but, but, um, but yeah, so there's, there's outreach to the communities and, uh, and, this, and all of our stakeholders and, and uh, meetings are available and open to anybody who would like to attend. So if you, if you think back to my complicated family tree, there's a lot of different dots, right? And so the way the costs are allocated, it's not necessarily, so say, say for example, the development of the plan, if it was a million dollars, um, the, the way the costs are allocated aren't necessarily equal amongst the different types of GSAs or the, the, the GSAs in the group. Um, it's, it's allocated based on agreed upon participation percentages based on different factors. And, and so different folks, you know, ag interests, city, cities, severely disadvantaged communities, all had a voice at the table when agreeing upon those, those participation percentages or allocation of costs. And so it's not an equal fee now, now how, how those um, dollars get paid is a different question, but as far as what your percentage of the total cost is, is developed with different factors in mind based on different circumstances. As I mentioned, a big part of our success reforming the GSA was bringing the Yolo County Farm Bureau into the discussion immediately um, and using their resources for getting in touch with all of their the landowners that are within their programs. Um, and they, being on, serving on the board, they actually act as the private pumper representative. Um, but we also additionally have, I think it's 10 reclamation districts, about to be 13, one irrigation district that covers 200,000 acres. Um, so we feel like we already have a lot of um, the landowners kind of bringing their issues to their local districts and, and then bringing that forward to the GSA. Um, and we've also done a lot of outreach, as they've all mentioned. And I'll just add that, that outreach to, to kind of the, the rural, residential, domestic well owners is one of the bigger challenges that, that we certainly uh, certainly face. Um, you know, we do have seats on each of the advisory committees for, you know, representatives, but there really aren't any, you know, groups of rural, residential 
uh, well owners. That, so you have one rural residential well owner that's on an advisory panel. You can't really say that they are representing everybody's interests. A lot of times people are living in those rural areas because they want to stay away from people that are uh, having meetings. So <laughs> it's, it's definitely a challenge that we face with. All right, thank you for that question. Any other questions? Okay. Is it work? There you go. Okay, yeah. Derek Williams. Uh, I'm a guy trying to figure out Sigma over here. A few of you have relatively complicated systems with subgroups that are somewhat autonomous, and I understand why you do that. My question is, are you retaining some authority to implement programs in the future, um, should one of your autonomous groups really not come through in the future, in your agreements? Um, because as I understand the state board's position now, if part of your basin goes into probation, the entire basin goes into probation. So if you don't have the authority to implement programs throughout the basin, you kind of are relying on the kindness of strangers. You're the Blanche Dubois of the groundwater group. So do you have, do you, are you trying to retain that authority or what are you doing in those situations? Okay, hi Derek, how, how you doing? Uh, so so for, for the Delta Mendota Subbasin in our coordination agreement, there is some language about if, if somebody decides they want to, to back out of the coordination agreement, they're obligated to still comply with Sigma, right? So even if you're not part of our coordinated groundwater sustainability plan, knowing that the state board could say if one of you is not in compliance, then all of you aren't in compliance, you're agreeing by backing out, you're still going to comply with Sigma, number one. Um, number two, what we're trying to do is promote the, promote the, um, the concept that, you know, some folks just say, I'm in a silo, this, this, is, this is what I understand is, is my contribution to some of these um, um, undesirable results, but, but understanding that if, if you may not be uh, adding to subsidence issues, that you're still obligated to help fix them because you're in the sub-base and that has subsidence issues. So we're trying to constantly remind folks that you, you may not want to... Um, play ball on some of these larger issues, but it, it, it benefits you to work with other folks that have to account for these things that may not be able to do it on their own to help this sub-basin as a whole come into compliance. So, um, you know, one person may be making that, that negotiation on one instance and somebody else may need to do it for another instance. And so understanding that we're all sort of in this together and sharing in these costs and these issues to, to try and keep everybody at the table, that's, that's really where we stand. But, but I, <clears throat> ultimately we don't have anything besides that language that says you, you must still comply to say that they actually will still comply. So projects and, man projects and management actions are something that are discussed uh, could because you know land following is one management action, but in order to try to minimize that, we're looking at other projects and management actions. Um, we in the Thule sub basin where we're each writing individual GSPs, it, it, it has not been written into the coordination agreement. Although we are all bringing our projects and management actions to the table for our one hydrologist to run through the model to see how it kind of affects each other. But um, in the Tule in the Tulare Lake sub basin, we are putting projects and management actions on the table to write into the GSP as well. But uh, there is politics that get in the way and it's also financial burden uh who's going to carry the financial burden although we've done a prop 218 election the G the actual gsa my actual gsa does not have the financial means at this point to implement large projects so i am reliant upon uh, uh individuals and and private industry to put some of those projects forth and fund them so there are some issues financial uh, and 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 just plain politics with you know within our boundaries that that cause problems. Can I add one more thing? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I want to add one more thing. Um, one of the one of the tools that I've been using, and it's it's kind of silly, but we we basically put together just a table that shows what what are the costs associated with if the state steps in. All right, so we just take those fees that the state has and says if the state steps in. You know, here's the number of wells we have, here's the number of plans. What would the cost be if the state steps in? I, and we just keep that up. <laughs> sure. 
We like to stay blissfully ignorant to this sort of a situation. <laughs> but <laughs> we did uh, put similar language in our JPA agreement about being a good neighbor and you being responsible for your area um, and you gracefully um, taking steps to um, ameliorate the situation. So projects and management actions. Um, and we used the state fee threat as well, which was very successful in scaring them. Um, but the biggest thing that we've tried to promote throughout the whole time in Yolo County is just talking about making the pie bigger and not necessarily starting to go down the what ifs of, you know, um, limiting extractions or trying to highlight any, any problem areas specifically and make people feel bad. But it's just how can we bring more surface water into the area? How can we conjunctively use um, our supplies to make sure that we are all sustainable and it's a big team effort. <clears throat> That's it. And I'll just add that, you know, th that issue is one of the main drivers that, you know, steered us in the direction of having a single, you know, GSA made up of all the, the multiple agencies. But there still is autonomy that's built into that JPA and we haven't really gotten to the, the really thorny, you know, decisions that need to be made in terms of you know, setting sustainable management criteria, what types of projects and actions are going to be needed, where exactly are they going to be needed. And so that issue that you're bringing up, I expect, is, is something that, that could, um, could run into down the road. But I think we're pretty well set up in terms of the way we've been coordinating so far to address that. And in, in Merced, I'd, I'd say it's really similar that um, we do want to give the agencies are a part of our, our JPA that autonomy to implement as they want to. But in the end, um, everybody recognizes what the real hammer is here. And, uh, and we do have the JPA that is there that could come in um, should one agency not implement as, as they should be. All right, and that's a good reminder that the state hammer is here and <laughs> going to be doing a presentation later today. So other questions? Dave Bolden with Aqua. Uh, the white area situation, several of you mentioned uh, uh, counties in the white area and the idea of them being sort of free riders, as it were, uh, you know, not by any fault of their own, but just the idea that uh, the counties uh, have various approaches to dealing with the white areas and various of you seem to have uh, different approaches to that. Um, but on this fee issue particularly, uh, How's that working in terms of getting the word out uh, beyond your own constituencies to those folks? In, you know, and are the supervisors, for instance, in your counties stepping up and, and taking the political heat, basically, to communicate this? In, in the, uh, for my, I'm, I spoke, I'm working on an MOU with Tulare County currently. And one of the problems is that we've already done our Prop 218. So this area, and it's not large, but this area that will be covered, we've already done it and they weren't included. So uh, right now the county is agreeing to backstop the coverage to pay their amount for that moving forward um, until we're able to or do another in the future. So that's how that works. So in uh, the Merced Subbasin, we have about uh, over 150,000 acres are white area. It's a significant portion of the basin and of the Merced Subbasin GSA, the JPA. On the board, the County Board of Supervisors, when we created the GSA board, they recognized that the white areas need representation. And so we do have two seats on a six-member board that are appointed by the County Board of Supervisors that are a western white area and an eastern white area seat to make sure that those areas do have representation. When it comes to the uh, funding and perhaps imposing a fee, that 218 process that we're going through right now, we also recognize that the outreach to the white areas is the hardest part. And so we know we're going to be doing more than we need to um, to reach out to them, but we also recognize that, especially in the eastern area, um, like somebody else mentioned, I think people live out there because they don't really want to be in town. They don't necessarily want to be, you know, in these big groups, so they're hard to get to. Um, my biggest fear is having a 
public hearing for a 218 and having a large group of people who come and say, well, I've never heard about this before. So we do know that we have to do probably more than is required to reach out to those groups because we have such a large white area in that basin. So I experienced a meeting just like that about a month ago. <laughs> Where are we? Uh, so in the San Rosa plan, as I mentioned, they are pursuing a, uh, a regulatory uh, Prop 26 fee. And the current proposal is that it would include um, the rural domestic users um, who are de minimis. And so you know, another um, complicating factor for that is in order to assess fees on those uh, de minimis users, they have to be somehow otherwise regulated. So in tandem with the, uh, the fee, we're, there's also a proposal for a well registration program so that they could be registered. So that brought over 350 people out to a community meeting that we had, and, uh, and th those sentiments were, were uh, voiced very loudly. <laughs> and um, so you know, that's, that's a political heat right now that's, that's, that's pretty big in, 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 our, in our community. And uh, there's, you know, there's currently um, other options being um, l explored for a kind of a plan B um, for the county or potentially others to, to fund the portion that would, um, that, the, that the de minimis users make up. Because as I mentioned, it is a l fairly large portion in, in our basin, over a quarter of the groundwater extraction, and that's what the fees are going to be based on in that basin is, is, uh, is extraction. And um, so that, that's a challenge. Also in our white, area, our white areas, we really don't have really, in the center of the plain, any active um, irrigation water districts. And so the white areas also include uh, agricultural and some other users. So that's another kind of complicating factor. Um, Yolo County in 2007 tried to implement a well ordinance and that did not go over well <laughs> at all. Um, so since then, there's been this underlying kind of concern that the county would try to get into the groundwater business again. Um, so we've very much downplayed the supervisor's role in kind of outreach and doing that kind of stuff, um, especially now that we have the new agency. But um, what we are really hoping to do is just to get the local landowners at the table again through the Farm Bureau and to, um, we've already have had a lot of good uh, feedback from a lot, a lot of the farmers in the white areas that they are willing to pay and they understand the effort that's being undertaken. Um, one thing that we're sort of struggling with is CDFW is actually uh, part of our white area in um, the bypass. And so we're not sure how they're going to kind of pay their share or help us out in, in this effort. I guess I shouldn't really say that, but they're, they're, they're coming to the meetings, which is awesome, but they do own a big portion of the um, property down there, and it's something that we're assessing fees everywhere else. So, yeah, anyways. <laughs> All right, and then just for clarification, if, if you're not aware of what a white area is, another term that's been used is uh, undistricted land, so that area that's outside a, an irrigation district or local agency service area. So just for clarification. Uh, all right, uh, we have a few more minutes for questions. One more question or a couple more? Looks like there's one there. Okay, there's one right there. Uh, and I'm Suzanne Petchy, and I'm Ag, Ag Res alternate on the Sacramento Central Groundwater Authority. I guess I have a lot of questions as an Ag Res owner. But um, so my question is because these um, special districts are special districts operating under the government code, um, and they've been operating pretty much on their own by the board members, mainly the agriculture interests. And perhaps um, they have interpreted their ability to operate their districts more independently of the law than um, than perhaps they should have. And now when we're getting into Sigma and looking at the operation and how the, where the board members live that are on the board um, and how elections have been held, um, how, I guess my question is how, because they are GSAs, because they are special districts, they have that ability, how do the 
uh, responsibilities of these GSAs as special districts under the government code dovetail or operate within Sigma where they are taking on new responsibilities and have new authorities uh, with respect to assessments and fees. How does all that, how, does, how do all of you look at that? How do you, are these questions coming up from your AGRES community or others that have been looking at the Sigma process as I have? And how are you going to look at the operation as special districts and as GSAs under Sigma? What are some of the issues that are coming up and how are they going to be dealt with? Anyone want to take that one? Anyone? So, so in <laughs> in Merced, um, all of our GSA, our our two largest GSAs are multi-agency GSAs. So I don't think we necessarily have um, the issues that that you're discussing. But I would say, as new GSAs who are new agencies in the Merced Subbasin GSA, we're especially intentional about being transparent and making sure all of our meetings are open to the public and keeping a large distribution list um, so that the public does know what's happening with this GSA. It's a new agency. It does have some new authorities. And we just want to be careful that things aren't happening um, where the public might think, well, that, you know, that looked like it was in secret, but it's not. So we're just really intentional about being transparent and being open about all the decisions that are made by the Merced Subbasin GSA. I don't have a large uh, residential population in my, in my GSA, um, but uh, we have sent out letters to every APN uh, uh, holder within our GSA more than once and a couple times through the Prop 218 process as well. Uh, we also have a website. We all have websites where you can go and find all of our dates, our agendas, our minutes, um, uh, and, and information there. And uh, all of the stakeholder meetings are open to anybody who would like to attend. And our board meetings are, of course, noticed and opened. And again, they're on the website as well. So, uh, so there's, there's ample opportunity in, in my area for attendance of, of the public. And, uh, and, and it's not a closed process at all. I, th I think you bring up a good point, or, or it's a good question about the, the new role that some of these districts, cities, or agencies have is becoming these new GSAs and what that really means. Um, right now, the way that our formation is set up is, is a lot of these GSA meetings are, are held um, as, a, as a committee, right? So it's, it's the number of those GSAs sitting on the same committee meeting regularly to discuss the status of the, of the plan. Now, as far as implementation and, and what e each GSA does and how they implement the plan within their local GSA area, um, hasn't really been discussed yet, and, and it's one of the questions that I have for each of the GSAs and that I'm going to be asking soon is, do you even have the staff to implement these plans? To, um, how do you plan on implementing the plans? And so um, as soon as we have a draft plan, uh, one of my things I'm going to be working on next is a workshop for every single GSA that's covered by it to ex basically explain what is in this plan and what have you signed up for? Because they're not at the every single meeting, they don't know every little detail that's going into it. And then we'll ask, you know, how do you plan on implementing it and how can we hold each other accountable? And what support can the authority give to, to help you implement it or prepare you for implementation? But, but you're right, I, I don't think a lot of folks really understand the scope of what this implementation effort's gonna look like. All right, thank you. And I just got the sign, uh, it wasn't my stomach growling, but um, <laughs> that lunch is here, so for for all of you that ordered lunch, it's here. But before we end, I just, you know, some concluding remarks here and, and things that took away from these great presentations and this good Q&A. Uh, you know, Andrew summed it up well that uh, coordination is his life right now. And so I think that's the lives of many of this, of all of us in this room and, and why that coordination is so important because it's critical to the success of Sigma. And Sigma's reach is, you know, another thing you said, Andrew, is the family tree. Sigma reaches many different families, whether it's uh, on the ground, the landowners, the farmers, the domestic well owners, environmental interests. And so that's really 
the importance of all of this and the importance of all this hard work that everyone's doing. So we were really appreciated at the department. And uh, I think it's events like this where we can share ideas that's it's really helpful. And so we'll continue to coordinate because it's important. And uh, I think, uh, and then we'll continue on with the event. So, but before we leave, I'd like to one final round of applause for our great panelists. And then some housekeeping uh, on the parking front. Uh, if the lot was full um, over across the street and you were parked in this time um, metered area, we've been instructed that you can park in the Rite Aid parking lot um, if needed. So just uh, so want to make sure you're aware of that. And then also we have the information booths out there if you're interested. And um, then lunch is going to be at the registration table. So you can pick up your lunch if you ordered one. Text. Groundwater Sustainability Agency Forum. Text, stakeholder communication and engagement. Well, thank you all for coming back. I appreciate that. It's one of the reasons we wanted to have the lunch here was to, to make sure that we, we had a, an afternoon session that was well attended. Um, but no, we, again, I mean, as, as Stephen and, and, and Tarn have said before, thank you all for attending. We really appreciate this. I think the, the first panel was a, a really great discussion. I appreciate those panel members for for speaking and for those of you asking questions and having this a really engaged discussion, I think it's been really, really great so far. So we want to kick off this, this afternoon panel. Uh, and oh, by the way, my name is Keith Wallace. Um, I, sorry. Um, I, I am one of the, the Sigma program leads uh, for the Department of Water Resources. Um, I'm probably one of the uh, least senior folks within, within the program. I've been with the program for about 18 months. but. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things, as, as you all, our Sigma practitioners know, that Sigma is very complicated and it takes a long time to really sort of get up to speed with it. Um, and so what, one of the things we want to talk about today with this, this second panel is stakeholder outreach and engagement. And, and so I think what you've, you've heard a lot of today is the importance of, of working together. You know, I think that first panel really showed how important it is to, to have the, the, the you know, the, the actual water managers be coordinating with one another. And, and so this afternoon we want to talk about the importance of another element of working together and that's stakeholder um, outreach and engagement. So not only is, is, is this a requirement of Sigma, but it's also a best practice. You know, I think when you, when you do proper stakeholder engagement, um, it, it leads to a, a, a better product, your outcome is better, um, it, you're allowed to have an opportunity to really optimize your resources. Um, you will are more likely to garner broad support um, and reduce conflict uh, in, in the long run. And so Sigma allows, as we've, we've talked about today, a lot of local flexibility. And so there's different approaches to how you can actually do stakeholder outreach and engagement. And so today we've invited five panel members um, to talk about you know, they're, they're from various geographies and have, have different constituents. Um, and they've, they've all done some level of stakeholder outreach. And so they're going to share their experiences that they've had so far, um, lessons learned. Um, and, and I think one of the things that they, they definitely want to make, they wanted me to make clear and, and lead it up to this, but also I, also, I want to make clear as, as well, is that this, everybody here is, is, is in a form of stakeholder outreach and engagement in, in terms of their GSP development process, but nobody here feels like they're, they have completed that process. And so they recognize that stakeholder outreach and engagement is an ongoing effort. Um, not only will it be something that they'll continue to do during the development of this, this GSP or their GSP, but even during implementation of their GSP. And so one, one final disclaimer, and I'll, it's similar to the one that Stephen gave uh, this morning, you know, again, we're not, we as the Department of Water Resources are not here to judge, like in any way, shape, or form of what has been done so far. Again, we want this to be another opportunity to really, um, you know, foster discussion uh, and, and a sharing of ideas. So with that, I want to introduce our, our panel members. So first, we have uh, Kitty Campbell, who's a supervisor of resources for the Westlands Water District. It's for the Westland, or Westside Subbasin. Uh, and then we have Ken Min, who is the project manager for GSP development from the East Bay Municipal Utility District with, in the East Bay Plain Basin. And then Sierra Ryan, who's the water resource planner for the County of Santa Cruz and Environmental Health. 
uh, representing the Santa Cruz Mid County and Santa Margarita subbasins. And then Sarah Duquette, the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of Mendocino County Water Agency from the Ukiah Valley Basin. And then last, we have Christy Jamison, the consultant to the Sierra Valley uh, Water Management District in the Sierra Valley uh, Basin. So, Kitty, if you wouldn't mind getting us started. Keith leaves lectern and Kitty walks up. Thank you. Once again, I'm Kitty Campbell. I'm the supervisor of resources with Lessons Water District. I am also the Sigma program manager. When the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act first got passed, surprise you not, I volunteered for this position. I said, I'm an engineer, I'm a problem solver, I want the task. And uh, fortunately, I've had um, a great opportunity on working on this program. So some background about the GSA I represent, which is Westlands GSA, which is the green area here, and that also is predominant with Westlands Water District's jurisdictional boundary. Um, surrounding our GSA are 10 other GSAs that we have the pleasure of working with, um, all of which are uh, critically overdrafted subbasins, <laughs> with the exception of Pleasant Valley. Um, so we're all on the same timeline, so that is a benefit in our uh, GSP development. The red areas in the subbasin represent the disadvantaged communities in our subbasin. And we have a handful that we're working with. Our subbasin is predominantly ag. Um, and I think it's also important to note during our last and most recent drought, um, our subbasin didn't get surface water allocations and predominantly relied on groundwater. Another complexity of our subbasin is we have Lemoore Naval Air Station, which is the federal entity, and the federal government um, does not have to comply with Sigma, but being a, a naval air station, they pump groundwater to support ag in the area um, to protect their mission, which is to reduce airstrikes. So this is an overview of um, the West Side Subbasin and the GSAs that surround us. Here's a map of our basin settings. The map on your left is our base of fresh water. And you can see you have green, yellow, and red. The red is the deepest area of our subbasin, and the green is the shallowest area of our subbasin. The base of fresh water ranges from 800 feet to 3,500 feet below ground surface. So it's drastically different throughout the subbasin. Um, the map on your uh, right is our topography. The brown is the tallest elevations, and the dark blue is our lowest elevations. And from west to east, it ranges by about 800 feet. And from north to south, it's by about 50 feet. Um, but over 1,000 square miles, it's, it is relatively flat. Uh, about 60% of the groundwater pumping in our subbasin occurs south of 145, which is just above that red line where you see the 3 slash 3. If we were to cut our subbasin where you see the red line, here's a kind of dumbed down cross-sectional view of our subbasin. We have a green layer, which is defined as our shallow aquifer, which is about 100 feet below ground surface. We have a light blue area, which is our upper aquifer, which ranges depending on where you are in the subbasin. And then we have a confining layer that delineates the upper aquifer from the lower aquifer. And in our subbasin, that's the Corcoran clay. And that also varies depending on where you are in the district. And then the dark blue, which is where most of our wells are screened. It's our lower aquifer, and um, the very limits of that is your base of fresh water. So this is a little background about the groundwater sustainability plan that I'm tasked with developing. So since uh, this is predominantly on outreach, 
that's what uh, the topic of our panel is. I thought I would focus on our outreach efforts. And um, our main audience is our water users and disadvantaged communities in the sub-basin. With that said, our, all of our meetings and our workshops are open to everybody. And so the question is, how do you get the mes message out there? Um, with our water users, since we are a water district, it's very easy to send them an email or mail correspondence of upcoming workshops and meetings. The disadvantaged communities in our sub-basin are a little bit more challenging to contact. However, we have been successful in working with Fresno County and Kings County in getting mailers in both English and Spanish when we do host our workshops. Um, we also found that if we email our workshops to the local churches in the area, local schools, and request that they post them in a community area, uh, that typically will get done on our behalf, and that's where we've had success. Um, we also are always updating our website. Our Sigma website is updated monthly, if not bi-weekly. Um, so, to date, Westlands has hosted 15 workshops where we have communicated what Sigma is, what we're doing as a GSA, what's included in our groundwater sustainability plan, what augmentation strategies that we're considering, um, what type of projects that uh, individuals should be considering, which includes cities in the area to help our sub-basin achieve sustainability by 2040. Um, we also have a monthly update at every single one of our board meetings. Our board is the same as our GSA board, and our board meets monthly, so there is a running agenda item to discuss Sigma. Um, another thing that we've added to our outreach is since April of 2018, all of our workshops have been translated in Spanish, which a lot of our communities predominantly speak Spanish. And so um, we have presentations translated as well as translation services. So um, we've hired an independent contractor to come out, headsets are issued, and if anyone attends our workshop that only speaks Spanish, they have the ability to get the same message as our English-speaking participants. Um, and like I said previously, anyone from the public is always welcome at our meetings, and I think that's how we've had a lot of success in getting um, people come to our meetings. Most of our workshops are heavily attended. We have typically approximately about 100 people, which is, which is relatively good. Um, and I think that concludes my presentation, and um, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions um, when the question and answer form starts. Kitty leaves lectern and Ken walks up. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, present to you what we are doing in the East Bay. Uh, my name is Ken Mann. I'm a social engineer. I'm basically charged to develop this GSP for East Bay MUD and as well as helping uh, see Hayward as much as I can. So with that, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on what we're all about, especially being an urban agency. Uh, many of you may wonder what East Bay and Hayward has to do with the groundwater in San Francisco East Bay. So we'd like to, uh, I'd like to cover that a little bit so that uh, you get better understanding. And along with that, I will go into explaining who are the users and the users in our basin and how we approach this sigma uh, as a law as well as a regulation. How do we approach this? I'd like to share that with you. And, and lastly, I will tell you what we have been uh, experiencing over the uh, uh, last couple of years. So if you're not familiar with East Bay Plain Basin, it is part of the uh, Greater Santa Clara Basin, one of the four sub-basin in the San Francisco East Bay. 
And this graphic essentially represents the, the boundary of it is that, that that's a bulletin 118 boundary for East Bay Plain Subbasin, where uh, the darker green represent uh, East Bay Mud uh, surface area uh, where we are GSA. And the remaining part is Sierra Hayward's uh, GSA area. This graph is a little bit misleading. Uh, the reason is that most prolific part of the basin, most productive part of the basin is from Oakland down south. So only the half of the basin is most productive. And, and the, the remaining part has so many legacy issues, uh, being an industrial zone in over uh, last centuries. We have so many legacy issues, and that hydrogeologically, it is not that productive. So we've been ignoring this uh, for a long time for good reasons. Um, and we, we actually, we kick and scream. We kick and scream, and we try to partition the basin. We pull all the trick we can have in the book. And, and, and DWR said, no, you are not getting out of this. <laughs> so, so that's how we stuck, you know? All right, so, so with that, um, uh, we are taking care of, uh, we are taking care of the entire basin as a whole, and we'll make sure that all uh, our criteria are uh, answered to. So that's why that basically, in essence, City of Hewitt and us are sharing a good part of the basin, 50-50 in a sense. So I said this to you because I like to understand our appreciation for our partnership with City of Hewitt, as well as how we treat them as an equal partner not as a small segment of the entire basin. I wanted to get that sense. So basically, East Bay Plain is about 110 uh, square miles, of which is, uh, East Bay Mud is about 95, and city is uh, 16. As this is an urban area, we have two counties overlying our basin, and we have 11 cities and five unincorporated areas within that, that boundary. So, you may ask that we know that you guys have McCallumy right and Sierra Hewitt has the has Hatchy Water. Why? And you will be surprised. Um, basically, that we are driven by the water code. Um, it said that we have to consider all these uh, interests and beneficial users. And more importantly, we use the DBR uh, guidance document uh, as a, a, a blueprint. I think. I have to say that uh, DBR has done, and as you all know, in the last couple of years, they have put out, published uh, so many guidance and, and best management practices, to be honest with you, very impressive. And, and, and why we have that kind of, uh, when we have that kind of a document, we better put it to use. So this, this is a list of all the uh, stakeholders driven from uh, uh, 1073.2. The guidance book I'm referring to delve more right into it. It's basically subcategorized each in, within the, each category who we should consider as a GSA. Although it is not a directive, it is a good guidance. If it is a good guidance, why don't we follow it? So, well, when going back to that, uh, if you look at each category, you will see that I have little notation for each category. And for example, for general public, we have a de minimis users. Uh, East Bay Mud as a water agency, by law, required to put in backflow preventers for those addressees has the well or public supplies to separate the, uh, the, the kind of raw water and our distribution water. Currently on the book, we have over 50, um, 5,500 or so backflow in place. And we recently discovered additional about 1,600 uh, well address, addresses with the well logs. So we have to put in another additional 1,600 in coming years. Altogether, it made out about, make out about 7,000 backyard wells. Albeit it is the minimum user, as a planning uh, agency, as a planning uh, for GSP, we have to consider them all. So our job is to reach them out uh, as much as we can over the years. Not right away, we cannot reach them right away right now. Uh, so is uh, major pumpers like golf courses, cemeteries, and colleges, and high schools. They now depend more on groundwater for non-portable uses. That makes sense, because if you are in any area in the state, uh, last five or 10 years, the water rate has been increasing for uh, good reasons. So with that, uh, many of those 
private entities or district or uh, uh, businesses are resorting to groundwater as their alternative source. For example, city of uh, uh, Oakland, uh, port of Oakland has the, the airport to run, and one of the, their biggest bill is uh, the, the water bills. And when the drought hit last time, our water bill went up for the drought rates, and they didn't plan for it. Uh, for, for their five-year capital, they got hit by major water bills. Now they are planning to use the groundwater as a, a secondary source for their uh, airport operation. So that's why I was explaining to you earlier that although we are the urban area, urban water basin, there are users uh, more above and beyond the agricultural and other uh, users. And we do have other uh, DAC, SDAC, which are provided by the surface water, but we still have to reach out to them. So this is just an example of our capital investment within the basin. On the left, you will see one of the five City of Hayward's emergency wells. Um, they put in for, uh, for emergency use and one of the pumping facility. On the right, we have an ASR project we put in with also with the uh, Department of Water Resources uh, grant funding as well. And this is the profile of our ESR projects and, and the pump setting. I'd just like to give you a little sense of the usage of this basin and the gravity of uh, the, the uh, issue to us. So then how do we approach this with so many different cities, so many different interests? Well, we, we said, well, let's plan for a plan. So our plan is to develop a, a plan approach where uh, we're going to take two steps. Step number one, develop a communication and engagement plan. I will refer to a CNE plan. Let's develop the CNE plan, then let's implement that CNE plan. How do we develop it? Again, I'm going back to the DWR guidance document where they outline the ask question, they define all that components of this for the CNE activities, which is very relevant. The reason is the, the water... Uh, the, the uh, uh, GSB regulation uh, 354.10 required to include a section describing notice and communication within the GSP. So GSB will require a section describing all these activities at the end. So why don't we plan for it? Why don't we execute all these activities to be able to write up the GSB section without having to worry about all these uh, details? So this is how uh, our, our uh, we, at the end, uh, we come up with the, the uh, CNE, guide, guide, or CNE uh, plan like this. And we make it available for everybody on, as well as our website. And these objectives are nothing new. Basically, we basically uh, translated into uh, these objectives from, from the uh, from GSP regulation. So it is pretty much uh, familiar to you as well. And also we included the flow chart of uh, GSB development as we see it. On the left, we have uh, components of, uh, technical components of GSB development. On the right is more or, so more or less we consider as a policy decision making, like setting uh, uh, sustainable management criteria and so on and so forth, where GSB will have more uh, policy driven decision making process. So we show this to our stakeholder. The reason is if you are a technically driven person, and you know where to involve in, in the process. Or if you are a policy driven person, you know where to involve in the process. And we just outline it that way, at least the way we see it. Uh, therefore, um, all the stakeholders can understand where we are, what we are doing, how we are going, and uh, where we are going. And this is the most importantly, I think the most important slides of my presentation, at least for us. And I'm, I'm amazed and awed by the, all the presentation from this morning, like and many of you. We don't have that level of complexity, but we drive for simplicity and we drive for transparency. Here we show how your input as a stakeholder will be considered. Whether you are the neighboring basins, stakeholder neighboring basin, or you are in basin stakeholders, or you are general public or anybody who interested in, your input will be directed to the technical team uh, through the technical advisory committee or inter-basin working group or as an individual. We will consider them as uh, the technical team will consider them uh, and then we will work with a consultant to develop and address the, the, uh, uh, your issue or concern or input. And then we will submit it to steering committee 
for them to decide which consists of representatives from high level representatives from uh, both agencies, HBO and Hayward. Once the steering committee uh, decide what to do, then they will uh, recommend to their governing bodies. For us, is a board of directors, city is a city council. I'm explaining to you this detail. The reason is that what if you are an individual person and your issues or your concern is not, in your opinion, thoroughly addressed or not being addressed at all? We have those governing bodies, the whole monthly public meetings. And every citizen and every person have a right to appear for them and make their case for any business we are doing. So that is a recourse. So by that, your interest or your advocacy or your input or feedback will be one way or another will be heard. And for us as GSA, we will do the most uh, optimum decision based on our judgment for the entire basin. That's our approach. So again, uh, we do have a, a inter-basin working group with the neighboring basin, like I uh, expressed earlier, from the uh, uh, Santa Clara sub-basin, uh, Niles Cone, uh, on, on the south and west, the west, west side basin, and Santa, uh, 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 Santa Clara basin as well. So technical advisory committee has to be formed with the, uh, form with the stakeholder within the basin. That is important because it's based in internal interest, so we make the demarcation right there. And we put out, oh, by the way, DWR has that, uh, I'm, I, I think I'm plugging for DWR a lot now. Uh, <laughs> DWR has the digital toolkits on their website where they give so many samples, so we, we use that toolkit to see what others are doing, like uh, Santa Cruz or others, other folks. So we do have a technical formation, tech committee formation process where you put in the little uh, interest uh, indication, uh, identify who you are, how, how you like to help. And right now, this is where we are right now. This is the uh, logo of the agency representing different part of the basin. And as you may notice, uh, water board uh, staff uh, from water quality, they may participate. And I have Michelle Sneed from USGS to uh, come in and help us uh, in when we do the subsidence. And you may say, USGS, yes, now you are local. Yes, they are, because they do have a research interest and they have collaborative research with us as we speak right now. So they are the uh, uh, stakeholder as well. So this is basically just a sample of uh, what it looks like uh, our stakeholder meetings actually uh, last week. And uh, the, our webpage and Twitter feed and, and all the social media uh, tools that we are using to uh, promote our messages. And again, I request Key to make sure that uh, they won't judge us. The reason is that it is an ongoing uh, process and, and work, work under you know, consideration need to be done in coming months, coming years. And statutorily, we require the stakeholder engagement in every phase of that implementation for the next 20 years. So that's why that I was a little bit reluctant when they asked me, tell us about what you have done. I said, well, we haven't done anything yet. We are still working on it. <laughs> so so that, that is uh, um, our, our, this, I thought this code is very relevant to all of us Sigma uh, practitioner that uh, we need to focus what we are doing because so many diverse things going on and this is the only way we can do it. Again, like many others, that we do have a data gap. We I identify uh, domestic user issues, and our basin boundary edges uh, has to be defined. What that means is we have to interact with those neighboring basins, and we, we that that's a challenge. And the the last uh, the bullets and challenges are very big because one city within our community they may like to use a stormwater recharge as a tools to, to manage their stormwater. And on the other hand, Alameda, City of Alameda like to bring down the water level because of their sea level rise and water level and subsidence issues. So they do have their earnest interest in different things. And as a GSA, we have to see how we can reconcile all these differences uh, occasionally conflicting. So we have to work on those. And we have increasing participation and we are still pursuing um, more involvement from environmental groups and many other interested parties, and it is an ongoing process. And we are getting a lot of support from our stakeholders, I'm happy to report that. And 
if you need additional information, we have a Jan Lee in attendance here. She is the manager of uh, water resources and also Ellis Tui. She managed Sigmar and any other projects for East Bay Mud. And you can grab them and ask them more information. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Ken leaves lectern and Sierra walks up. Okay, hi everybody. Oh, hello. All right, um, my name's Sierra Ryan. I work for the County of Santa Cruz. I'm also staffed to the two groundwater sustainability agencies down there that are currently working on developing their plans. We have the Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Agency, um, which is in critical overdraft, so it's at the accelerated timeline. And we also have the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. And before I even start my real presentation, a note on branding. So we have these two beautiful logos here. Santa Cruz Mid-County, we did that one first. We had a whole committee get together, make this great logo. We talked about all the different aspects of Santa Cruz we wanted to get. We even got our technical advisors to see if that was a good way to represent groundwater. And then when we started, and everybody loves it. Everybody loves it. And then when it came to Santa Margarita, we're like, do we want to do the same thing? No, we don't want to do that again. So we, we, wrote, the, we wrote the words, <laughs> and we added a swoopy. <laughs> All right, so these are our two basins um, that I'm going to be talking about today. And actually, this title's a little off. There is one more um, priority basin in Santa Cruz. It's the Pajaro Valley Basin, which is to the south. Um, but they submitted an alternative plan, and I'm not going to be talking about their work today. But... Um, we do have the Santa Cruz Mid-County is the one on the coast, the one that looks like a purple dragon. And then the Santa Margarita Basin is the one that looks like the little elf hat that the dragon is wearing. <laughs> so I'm going to start with Santa Margarita because we did um, actually get started in this basin um, quite a lot earlier. So it is a high priority basin um, in critical overdraft due to seawater intrusion along the coast. Um, we've actually been doing educational outreach um, sessions in this basin for about 15 years. There's been a lot of collaboration between the agencies, um, being there's three water districts and the county who have been working closely to kind of bring information to people and partnering with the Resource Conservation District. Um, and all that was happening pre-SIGMA, so we actually were already set up in a really good place when SIGMA came out um, to, start, to start this process. There was already good relationships. Uh, these are kind of the main stakeholder categories of water users. Uh, we have the three water districts. Soquel Creek Water District is um, uh, the primary. They, they get all their water from groundwater in this basin. And I should mention that Santa Cruz County is completely hydrologically isolated. We don't get or receive water from anywhere else in the state. So you know, when there are issues related to one of our main sources of water supply, we really have to be on top of things. Um, so about 70% of the water in this area is being used um, by the major municipal pumpers who are providing it for mainly urban water users. There are some um, kind of rural residential users too, but it's, it's pretty much all for domestic use, the, the municipal pumping. Um, about 30% of the pumping, though, is for kind of rural residential users um, on their own private wells. We have about 1,800 private wells in this basin. We know where some of them are. Um, we also have agriculture in this, in this area. We're really close to Pajaro, which is one of the biggest kind of strawberry lettuce producing areas of the state. Um, we do have some of that in Santa Cruz County too, um, in the Mid-County Basin. And then environmental users of water, primarily like fish and riparian habitat. I wanted to make sure they got included on here. They're not really pumping the water, so to speak, so they don't have numbers associated with them. But that 30% of water being pumped by the non-municipal users, those are the people that when we were starting our outreach that we really wanted to make sure that we engaged with because the ratepayers are fairly well engaged. They get their bill inserts. You know, They know how much water they're using, but um, we were not as aware of how in touch with water use some of these other users were. So in March 2016, we, formed, we officially formed the Mid-County Groundwater Agency. Um, as a way of engaging with those private users, we actually, um, we have a JPA of these four main entities, agencies. Um, each of them has two representative 
representatives on our board, but we also have three private well owner representatives on our board. And to choose them, we did a lengthy application process um, where we sent notifications out to everyone that we thought was a private well owner in the basin. We had newspaper um, advertisements and we got a bunch of applications, uh, over 20. Um, we did an interview process of the kind of top applicants, and there was a subcommittee of kind of the major group that chose three, and those three ended up on the board, and there's also an alternate. Um, so that process we thought was really good. There has been some criticism. I'll talk about that later, but overall, I think it has been beneficial. You know, technically, yes, the county can represent those people. You can say that, but I don't think that those people say that. Um, in fact, I know they don't. So um, it, it was you know, really important to us to make sure that everyone felt like they had a voice on the board. Um, and then we also formed an advisory committee I'll talk about later, and our plan is due in technically about 316 days, but really like 120 days because we have to have a draft. And anyway, loads of time. <laughs> um, so our advisory committee, this is a group of um, stakeholder representative volunteers who have spent the last year and a bit slogging through policy, including every one of our sustainable management criteria has gone to this group first. They're getting all of the technical information and they're processing it and making recommendations that will ultimately go to the, the board for final approval. Um, this process, again, it was a big application process. We were looking for specific people in these different um, kind of representative groups. And one of the questions on the application was like, do you feel like you actually have a relationship with the constituents that you're trying to represent? So we, we didn't just want a rate payer. We wanted a rate payer who's a big kind of mover and shaker in the community who kind of has inroads to the rest of the people. So to whatever extent possible, we could make sure that they really were kind of voicing and spreading information around to their groups. So we did the best that we could. Um, and we do also have one representative from each of the entities that are represented on the board as part of this advisory committee. So this alone has been one of our biggest kind of outreach strategies was to try to, you know, engaging private well owners by having them on the board, engaging large constituent groups by having them part of the advisory committee that's really shaping this plan. Um, it, that's been kind of our big outreach thing. And these advisory committee meetings and our board meetings, they're all obviously Brown Act compliant, they're open to the public, they're also recorded and they're all posted on our website. Um, so I think a lot of these, everybody probably has a website, they probably have some sort of e-newsletter thing. Um, we also have these bi-monthly drop-in sessions. So on the months where there isn't a board meeting, we have a two-hour come have coffee with a few staff and board members. Um, and it's really nice. People come, sometimes a bunch of people, sometimes just one, and we'll talk for a couple hours about what their personal concerns are and answer questions. And it's useful for us to get a sense of the misinformation that's going around because you know, sometimes 10 people will show up and they're really angry about something that they heard we're going to do. And I'm like, I don't know where that came from, but now we know we need to address it, so thank you. Um, we've also done online surveys, and we're actually about to do another round of that um, to try to get a sense of what people know, what their concerns are, um, what, again, misinformation they might be hearing. Um, all these agencies had their existing outreach. They had their existing websites and Facebook pages and listservs, so we are using all of those. Um, and we did postcard mailers, several rounds of postcard mailers, um, specifically targeted to the private well owner community. We also had a meeting specifically focused on the ag community, um, where we, we figured out who, was, who the ag owners were in the basin, and we called them all personally and invited them to a meeting, which was somewhat successful. We've also had um, been working with the press. You know, We notice our big meetings, um, and they show up in the newspaper, but we've also utilized editorials, um, and um, when we have some really exciting thing to share, we've been able to get um, a reporter out to the meetings. And that's been really good because it just, it really is a different group of people who gets reached through that. And these road signs, um, they're just these little sandwich boards with our beautiful logo on it um, that we put up every time there's a meeting. And we just put them at like some of the major thoroughfares kind of in the basin leading up into the rural areas. And people love them. They're visible. Um, it was like the best $600 we ever spent. <laughs> People t compliment us all the time, so I recommend that. We've also done one field trip. Um, this was really doable because the Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Basin is small. 
Um, I think many of your basins are much bigger, but still, if possible, it might be worth considering because so many of these people are looking at maps and they're so used to looking at these aerials and looking at graphs and then when you take them out and they're like, oh, this is right around the corner from where I get my coffee and oh, this well is right here. I walk by this all the time, I never noticed it. Um, that was really, I think, useful. So this field trip, it was for the advisory committee but several of the board members came and it was also open to the public because it was a Brown Act thing. So we actually had members of the public come too and um, it was kind of a full day workshop one of the advisory committee members happens to also own a winery that has a tasting room in the basin, so I think that's where they can <laughs> concluded. <laughs> um, so we've had some problems, too, um, with our outreach. I think everybody probably has. Uh, we feel like we're getting the same group of people. Um, we've had diminishing returns at our meetings. You know, we used to get 125 people, now we get 20. Um, we don't feel like the ratepayers have been as well informed about this, um, also the youth. Uh, some private well owners didn't like the way that the board selected who the reps were on the board. Um, having individual agencies talking to their own customers has led to this perception that there are two different things happening right now and that it's a competition rather than like a un unity process. Um, and we haven't really figured out how we're going to do the GSP rollout. Uh, but that's in like a few months, so we're gonna, that's, that's our next step. So quickly, I'm gonna turn to Santa Margarita now. Um, we, didn't, we wanted to just cut and paste our entire strategy. We turned, it turns out that wasn't gonna work. Um, so this is a medium priority basin. We're mostly worried about surface water depletion. Um, it's one kind of little urban center surrounded by a bunch of rural residential um, areas. Um, we thought it would be simple to kind of take the same process, but we weren't really considering that there's this big history of mistrust between the different agencies there. They don't have kind of the same collaborative background. Uh, they don't trust each other. They don't trust us. They don't trust the board. They don't trust the state. Nobody trusts each other, but everybody else is to blame for all of the problems. Um, so we kind of have addressed this differently. So this is... <laughs> One of the first things we did was hire a PR firm and a facilitation firm for this basin, and they made these beautiful graphics. Um, but you know, our, our users here are still predominantly the um, customers of water districts. In fact, it's only about 20% of the basin that's um, private wells or um, rural um, small water systems, and we have almost no agriculture in this basin. So we, again, formed a JPA, but this time we included a lot more groups on the board. Um, so we had six representatives that are part of the JPA, but we also have um, two private well owner representatives again. Um, this time we did a different process that was more of a self-nomination process where we said, it, okay, you guys who all applied, choose amongst yourselves, which actually turned out to work really well, but you can see how maybe that could not work out very well. So we took a little risk, but it, we, we were rewarded. Um, and we also have, um, the different two cities that are part of this in this general area and one kind of larger water user. So here, um, I'm not gonna talk about the similar outreach things, but what we've done a little bit differently. Um, we, <laughs> we hired a facilitator right off the bat and he helped guide us in developing guiding principles that everybody on the board could agree to. And that really helped allay some of the mistrust that we had, because there was a lot of you know, oh, they don't even care about the fish. No, they are, they're the ones who are pumping everything, and now we just need to kind of figure out what we all have in common and work towards that. So that was a really beneficial activity. Um, <laughs> we did discover that Nextdoor can be a very powerful tool when somebody posts a lot of bad information on it that's not correct, but it's a great way to get a lot of people at your meeting. Um, so <laughs> we actually joked later, like, maybe we should, like, come up with a fake account and post a bunch of misinformation so people show up because we got a lot more people at those meetings than we did at the mid-county ones. Um, and uh, we have a faci the facilitation committee meetings are also all open to the public. Um, usually in mid-county that's all kind of staff level but because of the issues here we didn't want anyone to suspect any sort of backdoor understanding so all of that's open to the public. Um, and then we made our meetings way more fun. Um, I think part of the problem in Mid-County was they're in the evenings and they're kind of people talking at you and then you can ask questions. But we've made our meetings in Santa Margarita a lot more fun. Um, we've gotten keynote speakers. This is John Laird um, presenting to the group. And then we have breakout sessions. Um, we actually came up with a game called Margaritaville. 
And we asked everybody at their table to basically be water managers, and we gave them each envelopes that said, you know, you have this much money and this much rain this year. And there was calculations and kind of you had to make decisions every year not knowing how much money you were going to get or how much rain you were going to get in the next year. So it was really interesting to see how people handled that. And I think it kind of gave them just a little bit of insight into some of the kind of balancing act that we're doing all the time as water managers. Maybe a little more sympathetic to us. Um, and I think... Um, I think that was my last slide, actually. I forgot to put a little one with my name, but you can find me afterwards if you have any more questions. Right, thank you. Sierra leaves lectern and Sarah walks up. Hello, I'm Sarah Duquette with Mendocino County and Mendocino County Water Agency, and we're the administrator for the Ukiah Valley Basin Groundwater Sustainability Agency. So I'm gonna start by giving you a little bit of background um, about the area. The Ukiah Valley Basin, we're within Mendocino County. We're considered a North Coast rural county. Just keep driving past Sonoma and keep coming up. When you see the redwoods, you've made it. Um, we are in the upper portion of the Russian River watershed. We're a medium priority basin. And our main focus is really the interconnected surface water, groundwater, and possible surface water depletion. The um, population of the whole entire basin is about 30,000, and the county itself is only 90. Um, so the city of Ukiah is the county seat and the population center of the entire county. In addition to the rural residential and city, um, there's also a large agricultural community. We have a lot of vineyards, and we produce a lot of wine in our region. A number of tribal communities, about six of them. We have four small water districts, a flood control district, and of course the county. Um, we, most of our basin does, uh, is considered disadvantaged, so we have a lot of disadvantaged communities in there as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the early uh, Sigma outreach. The county really kind of st uh, stepped up to the plate. We are a small area, and there was a lot of history with a lot of the different water districts, um, some of it not so positive. And the county kind of stepped up and took that leadership role to start that initial bringing everyone to the table. And so we have um, very active supervisors that have uh, water as one of their big passions. So we, I worked directly with them on some of that initial outreach, and I actually was new to the region when I started the job. So there was a lot of early um, research that went into the dynamics of who who are the actors, the players, the relationships, the personalities, and how are we going to navigate this process moving forward? So during that um, initial part, we made a lot of um, key, we met a lot of key groups and made some relationships and kind of put together that initial list of everyone we needed we needed at the table to start. Um, one of those key people were the tribes. Um, and a little bit of history, the county over the past five to 10 years leading up to this really started to make an effort to get more tribal engagement on our boards and commissions. So that kind of gave us um, uh, uh, the, the connections to move towards that with Sigma. Um, and we did some early one-on-one, -on -one, literally government to government, supervisors to the tribal leaders. We went, we visited a lot of tribes, met with different groups. We have six total. From there, we were able to kind of get a sense of um, they were comfortable engaging in the process. We also went to a great DWR event um, with the Coyote Valley Regis uh, Reservation. Um, when we got to hear the perspective of a lot of, of the different tribes. So they decided to um, engage in the process and, and come sit down with the rest of us. And that's kind of how we started the initial governance conversation with the county, uh, the water districts, uh, with the tribes, the agricultural community. We also included our neighbors to the south, Sonoma County. Uh, they manage the Lake Mendocino, and they have basins as well in the low region. So they also came up and um, joined us in the initial governance conversations. Um, a little bit about our formation process, we, we uh, got facilitations to support from DWR, and that was incredibly helpful. What I found in our basin was being a rural community and having a lot of people spread out, one-on-one um, -on -one connection was essential. A lot of initial assessments and one-on-one -on -one meetings to figure out, are we missing people? And a lot of times they felt more comfortable and could be more candid about their real concerns and issues instead of during some of the meetings kind of holding their, their cards close to them. So uh, during that process, we were able to work with the tribes and they have organized themselves with their tribal council and they sent us a representative from uh, the Redwood Valley Rancheria and they were able to act as a liaison through the formation process with the tribes. 
Um, the message we kept getting over and over again, keep it simple, reasonable, and affordable. We had a lot of pushback in our community. We don't really have a problem. We don't have massive overdraft, and there was a lot of confusion about this interconnectivity issue, and they really wanted to focus on keeping it simple and obviously being a uh, rural community that doesn't have a lot of resources and is lack lacking a lot of funding, um, keeping it affordable was important. So uh, through the formation process, we created a JPA. So you see our government agencies. Our small water districts during this period also started consolidation efforts and created a JPA for their administration. So they kind of came under one, um, one representative. And then you can see we have our two seats, one for the agricultural community. We uh, brought in the Farm Bureau and they were very in, uh, engaged and active from the very beginning, our tribal seat. And we also have a technical advisory committee that has specific membership called out within it. So a little bit about the tribal seat. When we were in discussions, one of their biggest concerns was they didn't want to get in a situation where the board could kind of pick and choose who would be representing the tribes and this kind of long um, nomination process of some of uh, similar to how we were working with the ag community. And they really wanted to make sure that we were respecting their sovereignty. And from the very beginning, one of our principles with the county was we wanted to make sure that when we interacted with them, we were interacting government to government. We respected their sovereignty, understand their water rights, and we treated them very similar to how we treated the other government agencies. So the tribes themselves, the six tribes came together and they choose their uh, member as well as their alternate, either by resolution or by letter. So they actually operate similar to some of the government seats on the board. Our agricultural seat, there was a lot of discussion about um, some specific criteria to make sure they were actually residents of the county, they had land and agricultural production, and they were groundwater users. And we worked with the farm um, advisor on that nomination process. Within our technical advisory committee, we have called out our resource conservation districts, our partner to the South Sonoma County. We also have the California Land Stewarded Institute. And we made sure that the technical staff from the member agencies were included, as well as the alternates to our stakeholder seats. Operating today, when we seat our board, we make sure um, all of the members are on equal footing. And that way we can have uh, engagement and leadership from our stakeholder groups as well. And that translated into the tribal representative actually being the secretary and recently reappointed re and having that leadership role in the conversation. Um, we just started our GSP development this past summer. One of our first um, uh, adopted items was our communication plan. We kicked off our technical advisory committee uh, this fall, and that's gonna start ramping up as we move forward with our GSP development. A little bit about our funding, our members decided to do kind of initial dues assessment with the hope that that money would get us through GSP development. We'll see if that really happens. And we were lucky enough to get grant money to fund the GSP. Our staffing structure, we have a limited resources, so we went through a collaborative model where the agencies work together to, uh, with the administration, and they actually appointed the county under the Mendocino County Water Agency to act as the administrator. So we kind of run the day-to-day -day operations and the meetings with the understanding as, as we develop the GSP, we're gonna have a larger conversation about how we fund this, but what does staffing look like based on what our actual needs are going to be for implementing this plan, and so those are kind of two conversations that are going to happen simultaneously. Um, we have a number of communication objectives within our communication plan, and I just wanted to touch on three of them. One of them is inform all engaged on how their input affected the decision. We all know this is a lot of meetings, a lot of outreach, and people get fatigued. And we feel that if we can actually show them when they make a comment or they come to our meeting that actually goes to make a decision, hopefully we can continue to see them engaged in the process and they can see, you know what, this really does matter, our voice is really heard. The next one is ensuring the integrity and transparency. We wanna make sure as the new agency that uh, we're transparent in our practices. We make sure that when we're, we're um, having meetings that that's known in the community, we're doing our due diligence and um, doing outreach. The last one, is empowering the GSA members. So we live in a small town, you can't really go anywhere without running into someone, whether it's the grocery store or just driving down the street or at one of the parks. So we wanna make sure that our GSA members have the tools that they need to um, take the information back to their respective boards, but also in the community. So when they're asked questions at the grocery store about the GSA, they can answer them. And often they help bring in additional people that we need to be reaching out to and talking to. 
just uh, some emerging issues. As we go through this outreach and education and plan development, there's all these unknowns kind of swirling about. What about funding or staffing or another drought or recession? And what does this all mean? Which kind of means when we take this approach for education and outreach, we also need to be able to understand that there has to be some flexibility. We may have to change paths, um, get creative in how we stretch resources, and just be aware that this is kind of an ever-changing environment. Just some couple takeaways and lessons learned. A little bit about the role of the elected official. They were instrumental in reaching groups that we didn't know about as staff or that they were hearing from. And so when we have open communi uh, communication channels with the electeds on our board or our greater board, uh, we can empower them to be um, our eyes and ears out in the community and bring people into the fold. Trust and respect, this goes a long way, especially with our stakeholder groups and with the tribes. That whole government to government and really um, understand where they're coming from can build an environment where they feel comfortable to come to the table and talk to us. One-on-one -on -one stakeholder meetings, that to me has been one of our most our greatest successes. A lot of times, it's really hard to get people to come out to our events, but when we go to their events or we schedule one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings or we come visit them at their property, we'll get a lot more candid feedback and in-depth information. And surprisingly, we have gone a number of referrals to, hey, do you know about this person? Or hey, you should talk to this group. So it's a really great way for us to expand our list of stakeholders. Um, Understanding the group dynamics, it makes a difference really doing the research and digging into the personalities and people's histories and backgrounds to understand where they're coming from. One thing that we kind of learned early on is the procurement process. They're actually um, just doing your normal government procurement process really wasn't enough in our area. And when we went to actually get our consultant for a GSP, we made it a lot more transparent and a lot more involved than we would normally do to kind of build some trust and buy-in from the very beginning with the consultant we, choose, we chose to move forward with this process since we had a very diverse um, board. Follow-up, follow-up, follow-up. Fatigue is real. We see it just like the rest of them. The beginning meetings, we had a lot of people, and then it kind of dwindles, and you have your frequent flyers. So if you're not seeing someone that's uh, usually there, it's a good idea to follow up with them. It kind of makes a difference. Uh, last, education and outreach. It's ongoing. There's a lot of work. And um, as we go through and we have to make some really hard decisions moving forward, it's going to be really important that we strategize and get creative of how we make sure that people's voices are heard and they're comfortable to come to the table. So with that, I'll pass it along to the next person and I'll be uh, available for questions at the end. Sarah leaves lectern and Christy walks up. Hello. I've decided after listening to everyone else that I'm the leprechaun in the room because um, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> I'm not a geologist. I'm not a hydrologist. I don't have any official capacity whatsoever. I am a person who lives in a medium priority basin. I'm just a resident with a residential well. So um, about four years ago, I took an interest. I learned about Sigma and decided to go to a groundwater meeting and just see what they were doing about it, see what they thought about how it was going to affect where I live, this beautiful place. Um, and so I've been going to their meetings for four years, and I've been volunteering, and every now and then they find some money to pay me for something. And so that's why I was introduced as a consultant to the Sierra Valley effort. So who knows where Sierra Valley is? Yay, not too bad, not too bad. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm gonna talk about what everybody else talked about. That's what that slide was. Um, so Lake Tahoe, Sierra Valley, approximately the same um, acreage, about 120,000 acres. Okay, I literally have to put my glasses on now, sorry. So um, this is at about 5,000 feet, which means it's snow country. Um, so we rely heavily on snow. This is a headwaters basin and um, it has one outflow point in, in the valley for the water leaving. Um, it is shared by Plumas and Sierra counties, which have a total combined population of 21,000 people. Um, not very many, just by comparison, Lake Tahoe has about 53,000 people there year round and about 300,000 on a, on a popular summer day. Um, we have more birds than people in Sierra Valley. 
we have more uh, mice than people, more voles than people, more cows than people, and on certain years, more jackrabbits probably than people. Um, it is an interesting place um, from an ecoregion perspective. So this is where the Sierra Nevada meets the Cascades meets the Great Basin. And so there's just really tremendous and wonderful biodiversity in Sierra Valley. And by the way, another thing about my presentation, because I'm just Joe Public or Jane Public, I put a lot of pictures in here. So these are all pictures I've taken, not this one. This is Google Maps, but um, just to maybe help keep you entertained. Um, the valley has a very complex geology. Um, it's got faulting in different directions, different kinds of faults. It was an ancient lake bed, so it has like hundreds of foot thick clay layers that pinch off on the sides and sediments and just all kinds of things that make it a very difficult um, basin to understand from, that's what the scientists tell me anyway. So just a little chronology. Um, in 1940, the Sierra Valley Decree went through that allocated every bit of surface water in Sierra Valley. So it's um, all allocated. And um, most of the ranchers who pump groundwater there also have surface rights. So it's really hard to get your arms around exactly how much um, irrigated acreage there is that is specific to groundwater because they're you know, they use the surface water till it runs out and then they start pumping. So um, that makes it a little complex. In 1962, Frenchman Dam went online and um, this changed some of the area below it, right? It changed it from a surface hydrology perspective and it also encouraged more agriculture in that area. And that just oh my gosh, happens to be the area where the overdraft is going on right now. So um, I think it allowed agriculture to expand and then people put in um, wells for when there wasn't enough surface water, right? So they could keep their fields growing. Because a, a lot of the agriculture, almost all of it is alfalfa or grass hay in Sierra Valley. And so um, probably some of you know, but maybe not everybody, that alfalfa is a crop that you plant it and then you can harvest it for eight years before you have to replant it. And so you've got a big investment in your crop that you can't, just because you don't have surface water that year, you can't just let it die. So. In 1968, the year that the Wild and Scenic River um, legislation passed at the federal level, the Middle Fork Feather River, which is where this all drains to, um, was designated Wild and Scenic. In um, 1980, state legislation established the Sierra Valley Groundwater Management District. So at that time, uh, I remember because I was living in part in Reno, I was going to high school in Reno, that they had a building moratorium in Reno, Nevada, which is very close to Sierra Valley, because there was no more water. So when I went off to college, there was no more building happening. When I came back from college, oh my God, right, buildings everywhere, because they went and did water grabs all the way around. And so Sierra Valley, was um, at risk at this, and so the state passed legislation establishing this groundwater management district to um, help prevent export of water from Sierra Valley. Um, of course, Sigma in 2014, and then um, an interesting thing, when it came time to form the GSA, this was a statutory um, GSA that could just opt out, right? So it was automatically the GSA for the valley, except it turned out that there was a very small portion of the Bulletin 118 Basin that was not in the district's boundaries. Very, very tiny. And so what we thought was a huge pain in the neck at the time um, that Plumas County, who had that strip of land, became a GSA, I, I now sort of think of as a, a gift that was in disguise because now they are at the table, they have relationships, they have resources that this groundwater district didn't have. And that's a yellow-headed blackbird. So only 2,200 people live in Sierra Valley. That's my friend's ranch, Roberti Ranch, right there. Um, so mostly the people are living on ranches. There are eight very small communities. Um, three of them have public supply wells. So that works out to about 54 acres per person, or 0.02 people per acre. <laughs> Just put that in perspective, so um, 
So it's mostly livestock and hay ranching, and it's been that way for 160 years or something. I mean, it was they were they were dairy farms way back when that provided milk and butter to the Comstock load miners. That's that was the history. Um, there are 55 active large capacity wells, and 25 entities own those wells. So mostly it's ranches, as you can see, but only 20 really. So 20 ranches, 20 families rather, um, three communities, a cogen plant, and a high school that has a little ag field that they water. That's where the water's going. Um, the de minimis users, with so few people, it's just a blip in the overall um, use of groundwater. So beneficial users include that this is the largest freshwater marsh in the Sierra Nevada. Um, because of those three ecoregions meeting there, we have just a, a, an amazing diversity of um, bird species and plant species. So 18% of the plants that are found in California are found in Sierra Valley, but it's only 0.2% of the landmass of California. So it's um, on the radar in terms of groundwater dependent ecosystems. Uh, we have a lot of mammal diversity as well. Um, there's a wolf running around right now, just killed a couple of my neighbor's calves the other day. That's always exciting. If there's not enough stress with regard to water, then you have this other thing going on. Um, so a significant percentage of the water, or of the land in the basin rather, is public. So we have two different national forests. We have BLM land, we have um, CDFW wildlife areas, three different wildlife areas, and then you know the cities, and for some reason the city of Santa Clara actually owns some land in, in this valley. Um, and we have some tribal interests. There were no tribes that lived in this area year round, but there were three different tribes that used it seasonally for hunting and gathering materials and that sort of thing. So um, those are beneficial users. Oh, hmm. Maybe escape. Yeah. So in a community so small, it's not hard to find the players, right? Um, they're not how to identify, but getting them to the table is a whole nother matter. And my observation since moving there 18 years ago is that it's the same people who are getting tapped over and over again. And so if, if, if I sent a, a message out to the Farm Bureau and the Grange and the Cattlemen's Association and the Cattle Women's, it would be the same people getting the, the message over and over again. And there are certain of them who are willing to come to a meeting and be active. Um, but they're stretched really, really thin. And there's no one involved in this effort who isn't full-time plus employed elsewhere. So there, there's no staffing anywhere that we have the, well, okay. It's a bullet somewhere, so I'll get to it. Um, some of the things that we have done are um, workshops. And so far we've mostly tagged Sigma on to a workshop about something else. So we've had a water day maybe, and we're talking about the irrigated lands program and water quality testing and just other things that may be of interest to people. And then we say, oh, by the way, do you know about Sigma? And talk about that. And we've had some um, studies that we've done on groundwater recharge and things like that. And so we, we say, oh, come to this workshop. <laughs> and then we tell them about Sigma. Um, we've had I shouldn't have done that bullet yet. We've had one dedicated Sigma workshop so far, and I sat in the back of the room and wrote down every the topic of every question that was asked, and they were all about subsidence, um, because when the JPL did their little flyover, they found a little blip of subsidence in Sierra Valley, and so now it's this controversial issue because people don't believe it's there, and you know it's just really fun. Um, we did fairly recently update our integrated regional water management plan, and so um, one of our methods of stakeholder engagement is to leverage that process. So a lot of relationships were developed. Uh, the way that we did our IRWIMP was with subject matter working groups that then fed up projects into the IRWIMP. And so um, those relationships have been established, and so we're trying to leverage those with the tribes, with the federal land managers, with the agricultural community. Um, those are just some methods. I would say we're in our infancy compared to the most of the people that you've heard in terms of outreach and engagement. So challenges. This is Buster. And he's demonstrating that the levers are out of reach because he's got his little short legs and he can't quite reach. 
there, so. He belongs to one of the ranchers up there. He's so funny how he jumps in the truck. Anyway. Um, so when we start looking at, at our overall watershed and how much water is coming into it, um, right now we're thinking it's about 250,000 acre feet of water come into the basin in one way or another in a year. And the amount of water that's being pumped by our agricultural community, which is you know like 93% of the groundwater that's being pumped, um, works out to you know 3.6% of the total amount of water that's coming into the basin. So any like we have this really expensive model that UC Davis developed for us, and when you look at um, the amount of error that could be in your climate projections or your evapotranspiration or anything like that. This 3.6% is well within, you know, like just a, a blip in the error rate, right? I mean, it's just like not, anyway. So to me, that's a challenge. That's a challenge that this is beginning to seem unmodelable. I could talk all day about how lack of resources is an issue. Um, the whole valley is a disadvantaged area. I'm not even looking at my notes. Um, so it's economically distressed. The district has a really tight budget. It's all based on acreage, parcel fees right now is where their budget comes from. Um, and then a meter fee. So everyone who has a large capacity well in the basin right now has a meter on it and has had since the 80s because this district has been around for a while. So on the positive side, there's a lot of information that we've accumulated over the years. Um, but. Um, staffing, so the district right now has a, a very part-time secretary. Basically, she responds to a few emails and she comes and takes some minutes at the meetings. Um, and they have a meter tech who goes around once a month and measures the groundwater levels, and that's it. There is no more, there is no more staffing. There is no more resource in that area. Um, when I read Sigma, to me it says that the expectation, the anticipation was that extraction fees were what were going to fund these efforts for people. But when you have 20, 20 families to put that on the back of for you know, maybe a million dollar effort, that, that's not going to work. Um, expertise is another resource issue, I would say. Um, I think that speaks for itself. Um, a thing I think is odd, but it makes more sense when I think about the state level challenge of implementing Sigma is that the Bulletin 118 basin definition is the valley floor, and yet our water is all coming from the watershed around us, but we have no control over that, right? That's not part of our basin, so it's not under Sigma. Most of it is federal land, and, and yet that's one of the levers, right? So when I say we don't have access to some of the levers, the, the, the federal land where all the, right? Because the deep aquifer, which is where the um, overdraft is happening, that is being recharged from the mountaintops around us. It goes really deep and comes into the deep aquifer. And so if we don't have the ability to um, tell them how to manage their forests so that maybe more snow gets to the, to the ground and infiltrates, um, oh, I did it again. I keep touching the touchpad there. Anyway. Um, you said that one. When you look at the watershed, over 50% of it is actually public land. Um, we've done one study that looked at that, what I was just talking about. The, the, so an overstocked forest will catch the snow and then it evaporates from there and doesn't make it down into groundwater. And Frenchman Dam itself. So um, this is a dam that's a above Sierra Valley and it's being managed by DWR, which means we don't really have that lever. We don't have the ability to affect the way that's being operated and yet it's affecting the water that is coming into the valley. So. And then there's other challenges. So I mentioned the geography, complex faulting, you know, some faults actually transport water other underground and other faults block water underground. So when we've looked at managed recharge opportunities, um, oh, sorry Simmer. Um, Anyway, um, the massive clay layers, I already mentioned those, competing uses. So I think pr 
probably from what I've heard today, you all have more challenges with competing uses than we do, but just a little micro example is that if you're a cattle grazer in the spring, you want that water off your land so you can get your cattle onto it. Whereas from a groundwater perspective, we want the water sitting there so it'll infiltrate. So that, that kind of thing. Um, climate change, big deal for us. We, we're already seeing this happening between you know flooding, um, rain on snow events that just melts everything at once, or the rising snow line, or just less snow altogether, increased evapotranspiration. These are all challenges that affect our, our ability to manage our groundwater. Um, in terms of helpful tools and strategies, we have 40 years of groundwater monitoring data. That should help us with something. Um, we've done some recent studies using radioisotopes to trace where the, where the water comes from that's going into our wells. So if we check the springs around the valley and then check the wells, you can sort of map where it's coming from. Uh, the forest canopy effect I already talked about. We tried looking at on-farm recharge because um, alfalfa has a tolerance for that, but um, it's not really going to work because our, our aquifers are really separated. So it might help a little bit with the shallow aquifer, but it's not going to get any water to our deep aquifer. Um, so we're hoping for irrigation efficiency and other kinds of conservation efforts to help us there. Um, we have benefited from DWR facilitation services and are hoping for technical services um, with some monitoring kinds of things that we need. And I already mentioned that one. So we have a long road ahead of us. <laughs> Thank you. Christy leaves lectern and Keith walks up. Well, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Um, I know we're running a little bit late, but we do want to open it up to questions like we did with the last panel. Um, so I think, Sim, are you going to take the microphone around? Okay. Who has a question? Um, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Eric Ponsley from Kearns and West. I'm just curious to ask all the panel members how you've dealt with the issue of uh, disadvantaged communities. This is something that most of you mentioned. Uh, exist in your areas and uh, n not an easy thing to address. So I'd love to hear some of the either successes or challenges you faced. I'll go ahead and start. Um, well, the disadvantaged communities in our basin, we get the best attendance when our workshops are in the afternoon or evening and um, also providing translation services. Um, provide more success on community man members understanding the message. Um, that's been our success. Uh, we've had challenges with how soon we need to be able to notice a, a workshop in order to get it into the county mailers. That's something that we're seeing with our next workshop. We weren't in time to make our county mailers, so we're going to have to be more active with posting at libraries and schools in the area and any community centers. For our GS area, we do have disadvantaged community and severely disadvantaged community. It's about 30 plus percentage, but all of these are provided by uh, surface water. So water supply uh, wise, uh, they were well served, but Sigma is more than supply of water. There are many other criteria we're looking at. So those are the communities that we will reach out to them uh, through the public messaging and, and especially the particular cities uh, within our service area, they know they are, they are cities more so than what a district does. So we have partnered with them, like I shown you on the screen, as part of the Taino team as well as stakeholder group. So those are the uh, avenues that we are looking at to reach out to those particular areas and identify any issue relevant to Sigma. So that's how we're looking at it. So we don't have um, a large population, a large disadvantaged community population. We have just, I think, one or two small block groups in Mid-County and then one in um, Santa Margarita. And they're all served by the municipal water suppliers. So um, water quality is not really a concern. It's more um, you know, water affordability related issues. And so we're kind of working with the partners um, to deal, to make sure that that all of that's being addressed. Um, the water suppliers themselves are con 
you know, they, they're working on that. And then we actually have a separate IRWM, Disadvantaged Community um, Grant, that's focused entirely on like water related issues for these disadvantaged communities within the county. So it's not being addressed through Sigma directly, but it is being addressed through the partner agencies, um, through IRWM and through the water suppliers. On the similar lines, we haven't really done a huge amount of direct um, disadvantaged community outreach through the GSA, uh, especially right now as a larger county effort. There's an effort to outreach to the um, Hispanic community and really looking at ways where we can partner. And we also have a city which has a disadvantaged community population within it and the water districts that serve it. So it's kind of a collaborative ex um, exercise with the member agencies and also really looking at ways in a county where you have very limited resources, what else is going on that you can kind of tack information about what's going on with that when it goes out um, and utilizing at the county level you have the health and human services but we have a high use um, in our libraries we have a big uh, broadband issue so not everyone has access to the internet um, so making sure we have information that they can get without having to go on the internet I would say we probably haven't dealt with that yet but I would also say that our whole valley is disadvantaged and we don't really identify that way so it's just gonna be talking to our neighbors and just, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Not much help, sorry. No, no, other questions? Hi there, uh, my name's, I think I'm gonna stand. Uh, my name's Amanda Monaco. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> um, I work with Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability and based in Fresno, California. Um, I just wanted to f kind of follow up on that question. One thing is identifying disadvantaged community, fo you know, folks who live in disadvantaged communities and another is making sure that their input is actually implemented. So my question is um, for folks who have thought through, uh, or, or this is more relevant to your sub-basin, how are you not only identifying folks and making sure that they can come uh, come to meetings and have that be an accessible and transparent space, but how are you also implementing their input? And I, I think it was mentioned that folks are more likely to come when they see that they're actually having an impact on the process, so how do you reflect that? And how are you incorporating policies and projects that respond to their needs? Thanks. I think that's the very reason that we outline our decision process beforehand. And I admit to you that we have to do more work and reaching out to them and hearing them what their concerns are. Uh, that is a, a challenging task that we are taking on. But we, from get-go, from planning phase, that we outline how their input, to any individual input, not just uh, disadvantaged community, any individuals or organization or representation input will be considered throughout the uh, decision process. And like I explained to you in my presentation, not just one way, it thought there's also recourses provided for them to, uh, uh, for their input to be considered and addressed. But most important part of your question is that, what are we doing about those inputs? The answer for that is we don't know yet because we haven't identified what their real issues are. And water supply affordability is a major issue. I'm not just um, explaining to you that because that affordability for us is a different avenue we are taking to make water affordable, especially during droughts. Well, during droughts, our rates goes up and we request a voluntary reduction in their use. So that's impact more to that com those community more so than day-to-day -day Sigma activities. So we're addressing those as a water district and water suppliers uh, in different channel. But for Sigma purposes, when we get to plan development, uh, well, we are studying plan development. When we get to, for example, uh, management action or the criteria setting, all these things, uh, we will make sure that we hear ev everybody uh, every possible way. That's what we are striking to achieve. Uh, we are tr trying to get there. So when we get there, when we hear their issues and concerns are, then we will address uh, accordingly. That's what we, are, what we plan to, yeah. 
And if I can add, um, I should also mention that currently all the disadvantaged communities in our subbasin are on surface water. And when first um, trying to tackle Sigma and GSP implementation, the thought process was, well, are they a stakeholder? And our district has actually worked very closely with Amanda and her group in making sure that they are a stakeholder. And we've done that through our communication and engagement plan, which we got input from community leaders like Amanda's group. And um, I think that's a way that we're showing that your input is implemented into our GSA practices. And our GSA continues, uh, expects to continue that practice and um, hearing what the community members say. And as long as it makes sense in our path to achieving, achieving sustainability, then that's something that we're implementing. Um, as well as all the groundwater recharge projects that we're proposing in our basin. Um, right now we're overdrafted, which means we're going to have to reduce pumping somehow. Well, one way to fix that solution is to implement as many groundwater recharge projects as possible. And in our basin, by doing that, it provides a benefit to all, especially the disadvantaged communities. Thank you. Julia Gollum with the Consensus Building Institute. Thank you for the presentations. For basins that are early in the GSP development process, in the early phases, there's not yet proposed management actions. And I'm wondering what your experience has been in those early phases for messaging that draws members of the public to public workshops or to become engaged in the process. Because, of course, later in the process, when there are proposed management actions, people will be really excited and want to be there. Yeah. Sure, okay, I'll, I'll start with that. Is this on? Is this on? Yep. Yeah. Okay, um, so that's actually a good point. We, we had a lot of problems at our early meeting, our very early meetings, people showed up because they thought we were gonna meter their wells. Um, and then when we said we weren't going to meet her their wells, they stopped coming. Um, <laughs> and then um, now we, we have been in Mid-County, we have been talking about projects, and so people are starting to be interested again, but there is a big gap. Um, and, you know, to be honest, we did kind of, we, we continued our, our meetings, our, our, um, our Brown Act compliant meetings, um, but we did a little bit less of the big stakeholder meetings during the time because we didn't want we didn't want fatigue. We didn't want, you know, community meeting fatigue where we told you stuff and now we have nothing new to tell you, but we're going to have another meeting again because we feel like we should. Um, we, we kind of held off on that and there were a bunch of meetings kind of in the beginning and then there was about a year where we really weren't having very many meetings at all um, other than the, the regular advisory committee and the um, board meetings, but in terms of big stakeholder meetings. We had some kind of informational sessions about how the model works for people who really wanted to dive in. Um, but now we're starting again to have those kind of engagement processes where we're like, hey guys, we're talking about projects now and people show up again. So that's been good. And um, in Santa Margarita, you know, to be honest, none of the projects that are going to be proposed in the plan are like new. There's not going to be anything in there that nobody's thought of before because we've been dealing with water supply issues for so long. So there's already some discussion going forward about what the water agencies have been doing and what they are planning. So that is coming up now. And actually, in our most recent um, meeting that we had just a couple weeks ago, we did have a whole session on projects, more conceptual, but um, groundwater recharge, recycled water, more conjunctive use of surface and groundwater together um, as most likely the way we would be moving forward for projects going in the future. So it keeps people engaged. For our basin, it is opposite of what scenario you are describing. Uh, prior to uh, management action, once we kick off Sigma activities, I think it depends on the responses or depends on the individual, basically cities or area where they have some type of activism. For example, when we started out uh, kick off the Sigma activities, 
um, community uh, public commissions group from City of Berkeley invite you know come to us and and ask us to brief them what we plan to do. They have the reason for that because as a public commissions, those are citizens of the cities. They participate in district commission and they have their mission. For example, uh, stormwater master planning or uh, riparian habitat, whatever that might be, they are participating. They like to know how they can leverage Sigma at GSB planning as a tool to accomplish their goals. Um, so we listen to them, uh, and they b turns out become very helpful to uh, our CNE activities because they are the community representative. And so is, for example, if we go to the north, the city of Richmond, uh, the elected officials are interested in our activities because they do have their own ambitions of uh, stormwater management through uh, groundwater recharge. And they like to implement what uh, Contra Costa County grand jury uh, report called them to do, which is to develop local sources of water supply for non-potable use. So a little bit opposite of what you're describing, but for us is prior to the management action, we have different groups or different stakeholders um, presenting themselves and their ideas. So that's, that's one of the challenge we have is to balance them and reconcile all these uh, different ideas. So when we started the process, we had a lot of participation at the beginning when we're like, oh no, we don't want the state to come in and we're, we're working together, let's find a way to create this agency. And then it definitely dropped off once it was created, um, when kind of the boring initial work started to happen. Um, pretty much the chair of the board could uh, know the persons by name who came up for public comment. Uh, but what we're trying to do is look at mapping out our board meetings and our TAC meetings so that um, there's kind of a flow to it and rather ha and have less meetings that are less meetings that are more meaningful than just having a lot of different meetings. So I kind of envision that um, as we move along the process, we're going to have to do some outreach strategies so they're coming to the key meetings and really looking at making them actually meaningful and just uh, try to reduce some of the fatigue because there is a lot of the same people coming. Um, and hopefully that will work and save everyone's time and we can all be together and make some decisions. And I expect that the farther along in the process, when we start talking about money and, and criteria, that we're gonna see a, little, a spike in participation. Not there yet. Uh, and this is a, a question for uh, particularly, well, for everybody, but particularly for, I think, Ms. Jem Jemison. I'm really interested in how you, as, as sort of a, as you said, just like a, a public citizen, member of the public, were able to sort of get so involved in this process. I'm just curious if there are things that the, the local agencies did that you think are sort of good practices in order to make it possible for, for members of the public to be involved. I hate to disappoint you, but it was more like a vacuum. <laughs> you were the only one that showed up, so. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I was telling someone at lunch, literally, when I came to the first uh, groundwater meeting that I went to, about halfway through the meeting, the, the board chair looked at all the other board members and said, this is the beginning. This is, you know, public's going to start coming to our meetings now. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> Not what you wanted to hear, I know. But I've brought a lot of other people to the meetings, so, for what that's worth, just by going by talking about it and telling people what I was doing, you know, just, so. Well, if, if nobody else is gonna ask a question, I wanted to maybe throw one more out. Um, and it has, it has to do with sort of the, you know, bringing people to the table. And, and I think some of you have mentioned that the meetings that you've had that have been most attended, or at least uh, most interest is when there was threat of, or concern over, uh, metering of wells. So with that one aside, what are some of the other um, topics of interest that have, have piqued people's curiosities and, and sort of encouraged them to come to, to, your, to your actual meetings? We're going to cut your pumping. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> At the beginning, we aren't in overdraft. There was a lot of um, 
a lot of mistrust with this whole interconnectivity and what does that really mean and how is it really defined? And so it was a more a fear of why the heck are we in this? Can, first, can we try to get out of it? Um, which the answer is no. Uh, and that's what initially brought the people together. And then there was also, I don't want to say infighting among the agencies, but everyone making sure that um, they're that they're represented and their um, whether it's their rate payers or their um, constituencies were part of the process and no one wanted to be cut out of it. So some of our most successful meetings that weren't driven by fear were those that were driven by um, data results that we were going to be presenting. So for example, um, in May of 2017, we worked with Ramble to do the SkyTim. That's that helicopter that can, um, we, we flew it along the bay, the Monterey Bay, um, to assess what the um, subsurface, where the seawater was versus, um, in relation to the freshwater, where that interface was. Um, and so, you know, we, we did a lot of information beforehand, press releases, and we called all the important agencies to let them know there was going to be a low flying helicopter with the tunnel like a tube thing attached to it but people saw that I mean it was it, it was very visible because um, it was right offshore um, and so it got a lot of people's attention and so we were able to kind of leverage that to um, you know a few months later when we were going to be presenting the results to the board um, we were able to get the press interested um, that was one of the meetings that we had the press at actually was um, uh, displaying those results. People were really excited by that. And then we've also had some kind of key modeling results about um, different projects um, that people have been talking about for a long time and how they would impact the basin. So those are kind of the, the positive way we can bring people is when we've got new and exciting technology that's given us information that could really impact their lives. I think next time you should put a banner on the sky tam. <laughs> <laughs> I give you an official answer. Don't quote me on this. Uh, and then one official answer. An official answer is that when we are trying to form a GSA, HB model or Hayward were not really jumping up and down to form GSA. So we invited all these cities and counties and everybody else to come in and see if they want to become a GSA. And instead of stepping forward, they step backward. So. <laughs> So we too stuck with that. I think they keep coming back to the meetings because they felt bad, you know. <laughs> so they felt bad. These guys, what, we, what they put them through, put, put us through. <laughs> anyway, in seriousness, I think each city has their own interest in groundwater or sustainable management. And because of six mark, six mark criteria, six of them, they do have uh, inter intersection of their interests and their sigma interests. So that's the reason that uh, they keep keep. Uh, keeping up with the process and learning what is going on. I think that that's what it is. I would agree with what Sarah mentioned. When we release something that's more technical in nature, like our groundwater modeling results, we seem to get our best turnout. Um, but uh, another augmentation strategy that has um, gotten a great turnout is when we release anything, that means that a groundwater user gets to be flexible, and that's what we've designed all our augmentation strategies around. And most specifically, the aquifer storage and recovery program that we're currently working on, which would allow groundwater pumpers to inject water when surface water is available and you're in a wet year or there's a risk of spill, and then recover it at a later date when we might be in a drought type condition. And those are the two things where we've seen a lot of positive response and great turnout. Well, I think, I think uh, we probably should wrap it up there. We're, we're quite a bit over time, but it seems like, I, mean, I really have, have valued this discussion and hopefully all of you as well. We really appreciate the five of you sharing your experiences and, and the importance of, of engagement and outreach. Um, one of the things that a couple of folks touched upon, you know, during their presentation that I wanted to highlight real quickly is facilitation service, technical support service, and then also our, like some of the grant funds that we provide. And so I think hopefully some of you got to visit or all of you got to visit the different um, uh, tables that we had set up out there. Um, so we do have, you know, both technical and facilitation services that we as the Department of Water Resources provide. 
we have facilitators that we can make available and come into your, your meetings and provide that, that type of support if you need it. And then I would say within the next month or so, uh, the department's gonna be releasing the draft guidelines in PSP for the third round of the Sustainable Groundwater uh, Planning Grant Program. And so if, if you're interested in that, please first, if you're not already, sign up for our Sigma distribution list, the, the listserv you know, email account, and that way you can be notified you know, when it is available. It'll be released for public comment Heavily encourage you to provide public comments to make sure that the program is being tailored to to your you know your needs as a as a GSA uh, or as a stakeholder group. So please you know pay attention to that. Um, we're going to actually talk about or have in a moment here another another component of signal implementation. But before I do that, I want to again thank everybody here. Please give one last round of applause for the group. So I will, I'll transition it to, to one of our, our final speakers here for the day. Um, so Jessica Bean from the State Water Resources Control Board has uh, graciously uh, offered to, to join us today to talk about the, the other really important role uh, associated with SIGMA implementation. So I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Keith leaves lectern and Jessica walks up. Thanks, I wasn't sure if everyone was gonna stick around to hear me talk. You had such great information today and I didn't wanna end you on a downer. <laughs> so I'm gonna try really hard not to. Um, if I smile a lot, maybe that'll help. Um, <laughs> so again, my name is Jessica Bean. I'm with the State Water Resources Control Board. I'm gonna just talk really briefly kind of about our role. Um, I have a feeling a lot of you may be really familiar with this already, but there may be some new folks, so you know, I wanna make sure that we get it out there. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we are the enforcement arm of Sigma, so really we come in uh, when local efforts aren't working, but uh, we do wanna make sure that local efforts do work, so I'm gonna offer some things for you to consider in this uh, presentation as well. So um, again, you're probably very familiar with these uh, deadlines, I'm not gonna go through them, but essentially, um, I, I'm assuming that everyone's gonna try really hard and is planning to meet and meet these deadlines, and that's great because that's important for compliance, but what's gonna happen if, in fact, a GSA is not able to meet these deadlines? And there's essentially two pieces. Uh, the first one is the probationary basin designation. So the State Water Board has the ability to designate a basin as probationary, and that essentially means that the State Water Board comes in and start making decisions. Uh, we make decisions, we gather data, we can conduct investigations, we can require meters, which apparently will get all of your constituents to come out to your meetings if you tell them that. Um, but then also probation's gonna allow the locals to uh, the opportunity to get back on track. So it's really a bit of a timeout period. Um, so you know, if, if you're talking to your constituents about that, you can leverage it both ways, where probation is not a great thing, but at the same time, maybe it's gonna push things and get, get things moving for you. Um, so the other th uh, point is that if you can't get back on track, the next stop would be the interim plan. And um, statute puts very, uh, few requirements on the elements for an interim plan, but it does give the state board um, quite a bit of uh, leeway. We can do pumping restrictions, another thing that's gonna get your constituents out to your meetings. Um, but also we can do physical solution agreements so we can look at you know how, how are there other ways to balance the basin maybe that locals haven't been able to do. Um, the third part of it would be looking at the surface water rights. So if we're going into a basin and we're, we're gonna have to implement an interim plan, we're looking at um, how, how are water rights working in the basin in general, and that's something that's actually gonna involve even more people because you may have some surface water users only that aren't interested in your groundwater plan until we come in and start asking about their water rights. So I'm not gonna keep it negative, however, <laughs> um, because again, I, I think you're all planning to comply and there's been some great um, information given out here today. Sounds like there's some really good work being done. And um, if GSAs, meet all these deadlines, you don't have to see us. We're not gonna come in and that's really what we're looking for. Um, so as you know, today, there's a lot of different ways that you can um, reach sustainability. One GSA, one plan, many GSAs, one plan, many GSAs, many plans with coordination. But I think the point is that however you divide up your base and pie, 
we're still looking at the basin scale. And I know this is something that was brought up earlier, um, that if you have issues happening within your basin um, and, and maybe a small point isn't gonna be make, meeting the sustainability, what does that mean? Because we are looking at this at the basin scale. So I think what we wanna really focus on at this point in, um, uh, in Sigma is that if you choose to go with the many GSA many plan model, which we're seeing a lot like in the, in the Central Valley, for example. Um, you just don't want to overlook coordination. And it was great to hear so many of these GSAs talking about that that's what they're looking at, is how are we coordinating in our basin? Because if you don't coordinate, your plan is going to fail, and you will go into probation. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we don't want that. We really don't want to intervene in your basin, but we will if we have to. And so lack of coordination really at this point as Sigma is going to, um, is going to be a problem. So some things that we'd like you to consider. Again, I'm really always excited when I'm just going to be reiterating what people have been saying all day. So this is kind of a nice thing. Um, but just some considerations that we have, especially looking at those basins that uh, are having to meet that 2020 deadline. Um, you know, the engaging with stakeholders and interested parties is really going to be key, um, particularly when you're looking at that definition of sustainability in the plans. Because uh, you have to reflect the needs of the basin, and I think that a lot of you understand that, but it's really doing the effective outreach and, and understanding what folks need. Identifying, say, for example, your disadvantaged communities, but then using that information. And that's going to be for all of your stakeholders. So we think that's really important, and we just want to make sure that your objectives and goals aren't just based on a trend or they're not just based on what's easiest if you're doing it at a vacuum. You know, you wanna make sure that you're getting that information. Um, the second part that, you know, is important for us to point out, Sigma is only one part of groundwater management or water management in general. And so if you are interested in connecting with some of the other water resource programs in, the, in your area, you need some help with that. Um, the State Water Board can help you do that, connecting with water management agencies maybe uh, water quality information, we can get you access to data, but then also we do have some funding available, so if, you want interest, if you're interested in that, you can talk to us. Um, not gonna go into it too much, but coordination with neighbors, I mean, that really is gonna be the key. Um, you know, it's, it's, DWR has made it very clear that coordination is important, and if the issue does come to us, um, an argument based on finger pointing is not gonna work. Um, <laughs> so we just want to, to, to point that out, that if you're, you know, if you're going back and forth, it's not going to happen. However, we're not also going to allow someone to um, be a holdout and use the threat of failure as a way to stop your progress in the basin. So that is something that, we, you know, that's kind of a little bit on both sides. You know, careful with the finger pointing, but if you have a holdout, or if you're struggling, or if you're seeing something in the future that's not going to work out, um, please let us know early because we may be able to help. If you wait until you get to the deadline and you fail, you're going to go into probation. Um, we can't change the deadlines, they're firm, and we're unfortunately not in the business of granting extensions, but maybe we can help you if you come to us before then. So don't be afraid to come reach out to us as well. Um, I want to point out, just last one, because the obligatory local management slide that we see in all Sigma presentations, but it's important because it's local management and local control and local decisions are the goal of Sigma. And if you um, can meet those Sigma deadlines or if you can come and work with us early, you can avoid passing that control and decision making over to the state. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it. <laughs> yeah. Jessica leaves lectern and Taryn walks up. Up on time. No, 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 you did a <laughs> well, now we're totally on time because she went so quickly. Um, so we're, we're at the end of our day, and I, I really cannot thank you all enough, not only for joining us here today. The team was so pleased to get such a positive response with the RSVPs and um, the fact that it's now 3 o'clock. With some of the candy, we were able to keep you here, and I think that's... <laughs> Partly due to the fact that this is um, this is a really important topic, we need to be um, communicating and talking together. So I just have a couple of, of little um, end notes. Uh, just I, I don't know the specific handle, but apparently we had a little Twitter feed going today. That was kind of exciting. What was that? Click the slide.
I was like, oh dear, I was not ready for that. Um, <laughs> so we did have a, a little Twitter feed, um, which is uh, exciting. A couple of, of things I wanted to note as uh, I'm pleased that I saw a lot of folks talking to DWR staff and other agency staff that were present. Um, I, one last time, what I would like to do is acknowledge our regional office staff, all who are here. These are the people who are your direct contacts. Uh, if I could um, just have folks stand up. Um, we have Michelle Dooley and Pat Valines from our Northern Regional Office here. From our North Central Regional Office, we have Bill Brewster, Christina Boggs, and Paul Wells. Our South Central Regional Office, we have Dane Mathis and Amanda Peisterby. And our Southern Regional Office, we have Tim Ross and Anita Ragney. So those are the faces and names um, for all of you folks. Hopefully you have met them before. If you had not, um, this uh, is a great day to do that on your way out. And also take um, the, the um, list that identifies all of the contacts. Folks that were here today, this provides their names, contact, um, emails. So we want to really encourage uh, continuing the conversation here with everyone. Um, lastly, the video will be posted hopefully in the next couple of days and so then you can always go back and, and listen to um, some of the feedback and also um, re-look at the presentations. Uh, and then lastly, we do want um, to send out a survey. As I mentioned, this is really the, the first of hopefully future forums that we can have. So I'd really like not only feedback on how today was conducted and what you got out of it, but also what future uh, ideas can be. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like especially to thank Simmer Denota, who was our lead out of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office. Simmer, thank you for pulling this together. And as we say in the Sustainable Groundwater Management, grab one of those little peanut butter cups. Buckle up, buttercup, because we have got a lot to do. So thank you all very much. <laughs> Text. Join the conversation on Twitter. Hashtag g.s.a.forum. Follow us. CA underscore DWR.